in these two economies, but we have to keep in mind this is a company, Moderna, that is looking to its post-COVID future, trying to expand that pipeline, and it looks like new markets. On the subject of the pipeline as well, I would note separately today we did get news that it is filing for approval of its uh, RSV vaccine that uses this mRNA technology in both Europe and Australia and has started the process to get FDA approval as well. So trying to look toward the future here, John. Remember, Moderna is down 73% from its peak in August of 2021, but it is gaining this morning up about 4.1% as we speak, John. Hey, Kelly, thank you. About 126 in early training. Kelly Lines there on the latest there. I want to turn back to tech. Instagram's highly anticipated Twitter rival Threads expected to launch tomorrow. A listing for it on Apple's App Store reading, quote, Threads is where communities come together to discuss everything from the topics you care about today to what will be trending tomorrow. Joining us now on that story, Mandeep Singh. Mandeep, how big is this going to be? I think it's coming at a good time in the sense that, uh, you know, Meta as a stock has done well this year, and they've proven that they could catch up from behind, as has been the case with Reels. So for the longest time, everyone didn't give them a chance, you know, with the videos and uh, Reels product, and they've proven that they can take it to $5 billion run rate. So my sense is, given what's going on with Twitter and, you know, uh, uh, Twitter restricting the number of tweets uh, people can have uh, as unpaid users, it's a good time because you see so many other apps, Mastodon, Blue Sky. So it's up for grabs in terms of engagement. And I think uh, Meta is best positioned to launch a product like this. Mandy, just to be clear, it won't launch in Europe, right? Is that the latest? That is correct, yes. The initial version would be a more US-centric and other parts except uh, Europe, given uh, this will involve data sharing across their family of apps. So remember, uh, they are going to uh, try to leverage what they know about the user graph from the core blue app. Uh, Instagram, as well as their WhatsApp messaging app. And uh, I think the data sharing is a problem when it comes to the EU side. Mandy, do you have a decent idea of how this works in practice? If I have an Instagram handle, do I automatically have a Threads handle? Do I take my audience with me? They will definitely make it easy for you to port over stuff from Instagram, Blue App, and uh, WhatsApp. And clearly, that is the plug that they are offering to bring in more creators to the platform. Any idea how Twitter responds to this and how they to be more specific, the creditors to Twitter respond to this? I think Twitter right now is too focused on, you know, companies using their data for large language models, which is why they restricted the access, uh, uh, you know, access to tweets to 600 uh, per day. The risk they run is if the creators move over to another competing platform, whether it's Blue Sky or Meta Threads, then they're never going to come back. And that's where they have to be very careful with the subscriptions as well as restricting the access. Mandy, thank you. More from Mandy tomorrow on this story. Meta right now up by about a quarter of 1%. Year to date, of course, explosive gains of more than 100% year to date. Let's talk about Rivian making its first commercial shipment outside of the United States, sending electric vans it makes for Amazon to Europe. A Rivian executive writing in a statement, we've had incredible feedback from drivers in the US, and we're excited to start international expansion in Germany. We're very excited about our future in the region. Katie, they sound very excited. They do sound very excited, and you can expect to see more than 300 of the electric vans that Rivian makes for Amazon on the German roads in the weeks ahead. Like you say, this is Rivian's first international commercial shipments outside of the U.S. Now, for context, Amazon, of course, is Rivian's largest shareholder, its biggest customer, and it's ordered 100,000 of these vans to be delivered by the end of the decade. We now know that that process has started, and that's one of the reasons why we saw D.A. Davidson upgrade Rivian to neutral, citing that the European deliveries started far earlier than they had anticipated. And you also had some more love from the sell side for this stock. Needham lifted its price target to $28. That, of course, follows Rivian's better-than-expected 2Q production and delivery numbers. So you add it all together, the stock currently up about 2%. It had been as high as 6% in the pre-market. But if this gain holds, John, it will be the sixth consecutive day of gains. And that follows a 17% pop on Monday alone. Unreal. Katie, thank you. That's the latest on Rivian. Here's the latest price action right now about seven or eight minutes into the session with negative 0.3 percent on the s p on the nasdaq we're down about 0.2 the second half one underway now big tech coming off the back of one of its best first half performances on record chris harvey of wells fargo weighing in writing quote a series of solid economic releases sustained the year-to-date stock rally and advanced the view that a recession may be avoidable i'm pleased to say that chris harvey joins us now for more chris always wonderful to catch up mate last time we talked we were talking about a 10 percent correction back in April, I believe. What's happening with that now? 
Yeah, I think that's off the table. Um, we are still looking for some sort of pullback. We think markets are overbought at this point in time, but 10%, I think that's too aggressive at this juncture. We we missed the mark on that one. We were we were aggressive, but we tried to get a little bit too cute. And, and what we think is you're going to see a broadening out of the market from here. Um, we do think there'll be some sort of pullback, but the pullbacks as we go forward, I, I think will be shorter and shallower in a two, three, four, five percent range. Um, and, and that's what we've been seeing. Very short, very shallow pullbacks. Uh, and until we see the Fed getting more aggressive, I think that's going to be the case as we go forward. Chris, I appreciate your honesty. So many people have struggled with this market. So there's a lot of people in the same boat. Can you just talk to me about what you've seen that has changed that's led you to believe that we get a further broadening out of the equity rally? Yeah, John, it's really a timing issue. A lot of things that we thought were going to play out have played out, but it's really the market's been somewhat Teflon. And the market's been Teflon for some of the things that we've been talking about, we appreciated early on, but just didn't appreciate the gravity. Right? The consumer has been stronger than expected. The economy, what we have been saying and, and the phrase we've been using is an economic malaise. We did think the banking situation would, would put a little bit more ripple into the market, but that didn't happen. Furthermore, we thought the Fed would be a little bit more aggressive. And in addition to that, some of the things that we thought from a macro point of view, whether it was a debt ceiling or with student loan, have played out, but they just really haven't affected the stock market. And one of the things that we knew about, but really didn't appreciate the, the magnitude of it, it was just positioning. Positioning has been very weak from the buy side. People have been underweight, or institutions have been underweight, a lot of these mega cap and, and a lot of these AI names. And there's a bit of, been a bit more to chase. But overall, what's happening is the timing of this slowdown has been pushed back. Uh, again, the consumer and the corporations, which we thought was true, um, just people are coming more to the rationalization that the consumer is in an okay place, the corporation is in an okay place, and we're just going to muddle along. And then the last thing is, it's just we haven't had, you know, again, what we're talking about, what we're seeing, what we're looking at is an economic malaise. And, and what's been happening underneath the, the surface is, Certain parts of the market have been weakening. Certain parts of the market have been just going sideways. And other parts of the market have been recovering. And so this is a very unusual economy and a much stronger economy than, than expected. And Chris, I was going through your research and you identified something many other people have identified as well. The surprise index story, just where the data has been coming in relative to where it was expected to come in. Those indices, that index now is the highest since 2021. And Chris, it's really led me to ask this yeah. question of you. Are things just better than expected or are things kind of improving, getting better? You know, John, I don't think things are improving. I think what happened is expectations and sentiment became very negative. One of the questions we get, one of the questions we've been dealing with is EPS numbers or revisions were very negative in the first, first quarter or coming into the first quarter. They were revised down and now they're being revised up. And I think people just got too aggressive to the negative side. I, I don't think we're looking at a recovery at this point in time. I do think we're looking at this economic malaise, but a lot of people are saying, hey, look at home builders. Hey, look at, at credit spreads. Hey, look, the, the Fed can't break things. And that's true, but it's hard for me to see this really strong recovery when we haven't had that big a pullback. And, and so I, I just don't know how much is left in the tank. I don't think we're recovering per se. But what I do think is there's certain parts of the market that are recovering. And again, certain parts that are just going sideways and certain parts that are beginning to roll over. Well, you say and, and so you can really see what you want to see. If I can jump in, Chris, it's kind of amazing to see him at yeah, yeah. 387. I've been away for a couple of weeks. So just to tune back into the market yeah. and see where things are. Credit spreads are really tight. Home builders are up by more than 40% so far here today. When you say things like it can broaden out, Chris, what do you like right now? What are you looking yeah. for? And are you seeing evidence that that is happening? Yeah, we are seeing um, we are seeing small caps and mid caps do much better. We are seeing a broadening out of the market. It's it's slow and steady. We started to see this in the beginning of June, and and this has been kind of uh, um, uh, something that up over the last. And what I think is happening is typically with the mid and the smaller cap stocks is they are. And if we're going to push back our economic fears, then those stocks should begin to work a bit better. And, and that's what's happening. As far as what we, we like, we still like growth. We still like GARP. Um, we like mid-cap GARP. We like meat and entertainment. Um, so that, that hasn't changed so much. We do think that market's going to broaden out here. And it's really related to the perception 
I mean, not so much that the economy has changed, but just the perception on the economy and the pushback of, of some of these economic fears. Chris, just one final one then, with regards to that specifically. Yep. Where does that leave energy? Yeah, energy is a, it's a wait and see story. I think it's a walk, not run type situation. Because again, we're still worried that the Fed needs to do more and, and that things aren't going to accelerate as we look forward and energy being more more economically sensitive. We could see a bound, but I don't think we're ready to, to go overweight the name. We're still neutral on the space and we're just looking for a little bit uh, a little bit more opportunity, a little bit more margin of safety, and, and for the economy and, and things to move a little bit further along. What a year we've had so far. Another six months to go. Chris Harvey yeah. of Wells Fargo. Chris, appreciate it as always, mate, and appreciate the, the honesty as well. It's been such a difficult year for so many people who have missed this rally. Big time on the NASDAQ, up by close to 40%, and the S&P double-digit gains. Remember when we started the year and we weren't going to see any of that, and then we did very quickly. Your equity market at the moment, about 14 minutes into the session, down 0.2%. The Nasdaq down by about 0.1%. No real drama here as the week begins to ramp up, looking ahead to payrolls Friday. Before we get there, we need to deal with OPEC. Up next, production cuts in focus as the OPEC Plus seminar begins. People sometimes ask, why then you had to do a Saudi Arabia the voluntary cut? And my answer, it's very simple. We had to do it because there was another ask for the market, a more immediate ask or a more immediate expectation of the market that the OPEC Plus would need to do so. Bloomberg's Manus Cranny on the ground in Vienna, up next. reshaping the C-suite. Bloomberg's chief future officer shines a spotlight on these dynamic leaders. Fenway Sports Group has become a $10 billion global powerhouse. CFO Julie Swinehart tells Tom Keen how she's helping the company raise its game. Winning's at the core of everything we do here, and the balance sheet is so important to the success of the team. Watch Chief Future Officer Wednesday on Bloomberg. Economic pain may turn into emerging markets gain. Investors say they plan to allocate more funds to emerging markets over the next year. That's according to the latest Bloomberg survey of professional and retail investors. More than 60% of respondents are betting emerging markets will either push higher or outperform the developed markets if the U.S. economy tips into recession. This would mark a significant change in leadership that's been in place for more than a decade in which U.S. stocks have returned more than 700% since March 2009, dominating the rest of the world. Within EM, market watchers rank stocks as the best investment, followed by a tie between debt in local currencies and U.S. dollars. Lower valuations is a big draw. In equities, the MSCI Emerging Market Index trades at 12 and a half times estimated 2023 earnings. By contrast, the S&P 500 has a multiple of more than 18 and a half. External factors may end up proving to be bigger influences on emerging markets than domestic politics. The dollar's weakening trend means companies in emerging markets should have more room for growth. And countries that did not prop up their economies with stimulus during the pandemic may be better positioned to return to a growth rate that's sustainable. Looking out over the next two years, respondents overwhelmingly made Southeast Asia their top pick, beating out Latin America and Eastern Europe by a wide margin. UK, your 
source for news and analysis covering the biggest challenges facing the UK government, economy, financial services, and markets. Tax cuts should not be the priority. It's about a credible plan for growth over the next two, three years. In this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients? It was disruptive, and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works. Now we're having the perfect storm in the UK. Watch Francine Lacqua Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. Billions of people depend on our commodity, oil, for daily life. This is an inescapable reality that warrants respect. That is why OPEC pursues market stability. Of course, as an industry, we want to ensure that we have an emissions-free future. Harnessing technologies that can do this will be one of the predominant themes of this seminar. However, oil is too central and fundamental for life just to stop. The OPEC Plus seminar kicking off on the heels of production cuts by Saudi Arabia and Russia. The UAE announcing that it won't be making further supply cuts, saying the nation is already doing enough to contribute. Bloomberg's Manus Cranny joins us now from Vienna with more. Hey, Manus. Jonathan, very good afternoon. It wasn't supposed to be this way, was it? <laughs> Talk to me about I mean, it. I'm in the... Well, I'll tell you what happened. It was supposed to be a beautifully spectacular backdrop for you outside the Hopkirk Palace. I decamped to the Hyatt, the Park Hyatt, which is where the Saudis are staying. Of course, the Saudis are the center stage. Uh, what we have here, Jonathan, I say, is uh, a, a pretty classic moment of where the market was doubtful. You know the phrase, do whatever it takes. You remember it, I remember it. Mario Draghi, Prince did Here we are again. Prince Abdullah has been Salman, keeps using it. And I thought to myself, I was sitting here waiting to come on. I thought, what does that really mean? What it means is an extension of a unilateral cut of a million barrels a day, but to do whatever it takes actually means he shifted the political narrative because now the Russians have stepped up to the plate. They're doing 500,000 barrels of a cut in exports, and this is the important point. They're prepared to cut exports, which is what we can manage and understand. Don't worry too much about whether they're going to cut production because who knows? That's like a big, dark vortex. It's a bit like my life at the moment. But that's the point. That is the fundamental point. Cushing, which is, of course, in the United States of America, we have a problem. We have an oversupply problem from Iran, Venezuela, uh, from the United States of America, and from Russia. And so we're desperately trying to grapple back some control on the supply narrative. Manus, what does that mean for pricing? And are they comfortable with where we are right now at 76 couldn't on be. Bren? Where are they going to be comfortable? They well, put it this way. I, four weeks ago, I was here in Vienna outside the OPEC headquarters and they did a unilateral cut which was quite unexpected and the market went, yeah and what else so 74 76 74 76 you can trade that range all day you could even write some volatility into this but the point about it is they i would say that they've created a floor so in other words we've taken three percent of the global production off the market that and they kept trying to push the selling prices to china and asia higher that invoked destocking in china and in asia and that's where the battle is at the moment. 74, 76 is not acceptable to either the economic dream of Saudi Arabia or to the war plans of Putin in terms of the dollars that he needs to fund the war. And Mohammed bin Salman needs to deliver an economic dream. I say it again and again and again. To deliver on the Alula dream, the Red Sea, etc. It takes 100 bucks on break even. Fiscally, the IMF says $80. This is a floor protection mechanism rather than creating the narrative for $100 oil. Jonathan. Manus, thank you. I've loved the coverage. We can have a therapy session on the phone a little bit later and talk about <laughs> life's problems. Manus, thank you. About 22 minutes into the session, equities negative 0.2% on the S&P and the Nasdaq down by 0.1%. let us lift the lid on this index and get you some sector price action. Back with us, here's Abby. Well, it's hard to follow that one, John, but we will try. And relative to sector action, not surprising, we, surprisingly, with the S&P 500 down slightly, we have more sectors off than not. The worst is materials down 1.5% than the financials, industrials. Speaking of energy, there it is, down four tenths of 1%. To the upside, though, community 
communication services up about nine tenths of one percent. Let's take another look at those banks because we've had some real strength in the banks recently over the last couple of days, uh, but not so much today. We have uh, weakness for the S&P 500 financials, the KBW Bank Index, along with the regionals. It's not entirely clear what's behind this, John, uh, but there you have it. Some weakness again for the banks, even with yields. Well, at this point, we now have that two-year yield coming in, so maybe that's a piece of it. Bank earnings a week away. Abby, thanks for that. Up next on the program, your trading diary. say Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent, they have gigantic market values and they're very prominent in China, not as prominent outside of China as obviously in China and certainly not that prominent in the United States. TikTok, by contrast, is not in China, but it's gigantic outside of China, of the United States and everywhere. What did TikTok do that enabled a Chinese-based company, parent company at least, to do so well outside of China? We think it's challenging to build a global company uh, in general, but the best ones we have seen so far are ones that take very consistent global learnings and adapt them to the local to, to the local to the local countries that they are operating in. So you need to be global and local at the same time. three-day winning streak at the moment on the S&P 500. Let's see if we can break that in the next few hours. We're down just a little bit on the S&P. We're down about 0.2% on the Nasdaq, shifting into positive territory. Our performer, the Russell, has done all year. On the Nasdaq right now, positive 0.1%. The Russell, the small caps, deeply negative, down by a little more than one full percentage point. That's the price action as we kick off the back end of the week. Let's get to the trading diary. Fed minutes coming up a little bit later, 2 p.m. Eastern time. New York Fed President John Williams speaking at 4 p.m. this afternoon. A touch of Fed speak for you. Then Secretary Yellen arriving in Beijing tomorrow. We'll get another round of jobless claims too. And jolts numbers, the job openings report, ahead of the payrolls report, the main event on Friday. For those of you interested, the survey right now here at Bloomberg, the numbers, the estimates still pouring in, but the median estimates so far in our survey, 225,000, just down from 339. Unemployment expected to come in. Mike McKee talked about that a little bit earlier. The estimate 3.6 percent. The previous read, 3.7. All of that still to come from New York. That is it for me. Thanks for choosing Bloomberg TV. This is Bloomberg.
don't think we can replicate Tesla. Tesla is a unique uh, because when they found it uh, and then the personality behind it, uh, the product is beautiful, technologically uh, very, very strong. So in many areas, Tesla is Tesla, um, but x is x -Pen. We want to focus on what we think is important for our customers. Our customer like beautifully designed vehicles, either it's large SUV or sports sedan. We believe we have a very, very appealing uh, family look that our customers is really attracted to. Uh, they like to have user-friendly features inside the cabin that has a technology feel. It's very smart. It enables them to really utilize the vehicle that's different. A lot's happening on Wall Street. There are so many factors at play today. It remains tight in, in certain parts of the economy. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We've got the information and insight. Crisis is too strong a word, and words like that get used a lot. From businesses most influential and instrumental. America's economy needs a diversity of institutions. That's something that Wall Street pays a lot of attention to. Bloomberg Wall Street Week, live tonight with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. It was going to keep rain World Cup. This is a three. As the economic picture dies. Is it be okay? It's getting ready to make This is Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney. We got a lot of green on the screen here, but the volume is light. This is a market that's much more optimistic or bullish than maybe the central bankers are. 9.5 million job openings. What are people doing? Are they just sitting in Starbucks all day? Breaking market news and insight from Bloomberg experts. There's still some concern out there in the market that there is room for things to deteriorate a little bit more than what they're indicating. As small and medium-sized businesses struggle, they don't present as much competition. What are you guys thinking about hardware, software? How should investors approach this thing called AI. This is Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. All right, good Wednesday morning from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York City to our worldwide audience. Red on the screen, S&P 500 off two-tenths of 1%. We'll get to the markets in just a moment. Uh, we're going to check in with Kriti Gupta, uh, markets editor and host of Bloomberg Surveillance. She's got some reporting on the upcoming potential strike at UPS. We'll get the latest on that. Plus, Ira Jersey, chief U.S. interest rate strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence, previews Fed minutes today and discusses the yield curve. It is inverted really inverted. So we've got the latest there. Plus, Nimrit Kang, co-CIO and senior PM at Northstar Asset Management, will join uh, to get her market outlook. But first, let's go to John Tucker and get a Bloomberg business flash, John. Now, Paul, the major averagers, they're um, just uh, slightly lower at this point. We're data dependent, at least so we say we are. So uh, let's go right to the data. We're getting factory orders. When you strip out transportation, a little worse than uh, they were last month, down uh, 0.5%. Uh, right now, we're looking at the durable goods. When you strip out transportation, that was better than expected, up uh, 7 tenths of a percent for the last reporting period. Uh, the best definition I got for durable goods was the stuff that hurts when you drop it on your foot. So there you go. Uh, right now, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, 135 points lower. That's down four tenths of a percent. The S&P 500 down nine points. That's down two tenths of a percent. The NASDAQ 100, that is higher right now, up a tenth of a percent, up 19 points at 15,000. 228. Well, investors are betting the Fed's going to hike interest rates this month. Drew Mattis at MetLife is disagreeing with that call. When we look ahead to the Fed meeting, um, you know, what they had said was they're just not sure that they have enough, you know, strong data effectively to keep hiking rates um, at the June meeting. Um, and I don't think they're going to get that data for the July meeting either. And later today, we're going to get the minutes from the last Fed meeting. 
We'll get a better look at why they paused uh, at the same time, forecast two more rate hikes this year. A little confusing, to say the least. Uh, among individual movers uh, today, Brookfield Reinsurance agreeing to buy all the shares in American Equity Investment Life Holding. It doesn't already own the price tag, $55 a share. Uh, again, the S&P 500, seven points lower. I'm John Tucker. We check the markets for you all day long, right here on Bloomberg Radio. Paul. All right, John Tucker, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Molly Smith sitting in today. Molly, great to see you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Good morning. All right, you just informed me that you're a, a tennis like jock geek. You're all in tennis, right? A hundred percent. So Always you played in high school, then you played in college. Where'd you play in college? I played Syracuse. Syracuse. Yes. yes. That's big time. It's a lot. It's of course, fun. it's snow. Yeah. You have no spring season, right? I mean, you get you have to go south, right? It's kind of a year-round indoor commitment. Okay. Yeah. Year so you're fired up. It's Wimbledon. <laughs> I'm pumped, yes. I've only had the honor to play on grass courts once. Okay. Um, can only imagine what it's like to play so on the So do you go to the U.S. Open when it comes here? Oh, I mean, I'm, I've already got tickets for five days. So I'm nice. going to camp right. out in Flushing. Right. Good. Yeah. I got the first Tuesday. I'm there. So we'll <laughs> I'll appreciate. see you there. Yes. All right. Great. Awesome. All right. Thanks for coming in. All right. Let's get to these markets here. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not seeing a whole lot here. The Dow off of about four tenths of one percent. But let's bring in Emily Grafeo. She covers all these markets. She's a cross asset reporter. Emily, what are you looking at this morning? So it's a choppy session on the index level. But taking a look at some of the individual movers, Rivian, that electric vehicle company, the stock has been on an absolute tear lately. Right. Right now, only up about 3%, but it rose 17% on Monday. And nice. it's also rosing, it rose about 13% in the month of June. Today, they started delivering electric vans that it makes to Amazon to Europe. This okay. is the first shipment that they've had outside of the U.S. So they're expected to deliver about 300 vans to Germany in the coming weeks. And it's seeing a few analyst upgrades on the street on this news. And Emily, you'd also said to us you wanted to uh, talk a little bit about Moderna. It looks like they've got a first investment in China coming up possibly as soon as today. Right, yeah. That stock actually up even more than Rivian, now about 4.6% higher. And there was a report that they signed a memorandum of understanding and a land collaboration agreement to work toward researching, developing, and producing M. RNA vaccines in China. This would be their first um, moves in China, and the um, they may invest up to around a billion dollars, according to a local media outlet in China, for this mRNA research. That stock, though, is still down 30 percent year to date. Yep. Have you either of you guys been flying at all this summer? A little bit. Yeah. I haven't done any flying. No. And well, my new strategy is I'm only flying when I get paid to fly. Mm -hmm. So, um, but apparently it's just been brutal out there. And uh, Tom Keen had Helene Becker from Cowan on earlier. She's the analyst there. She's been covering airlines for decades. And she says this, this, the tough flying conditions, they're not going away anytime soon. I mean, it's simply that, uh, you know, the uh, air traffic control, they're just at their capacity here. I'm looking at the airline stocks. Mm -hmm. I mean, year to date, they're all up 30, 40%, because I guess people are just, flying so you got to buy the airline stocks yep all that consumer discretionary strength maybe it'll continue into the second half but the cruise liners were up like over a hundred percent for the yep. first half i cannot get over that I are you a, keep bringing are it you up. a cruise line person i'm not a cruise are line a person, cruise line person? <laughs> uh, not so much have you been on a cruise i have uh maybe like a disney cruise as a kid yeah okay so, you have, so yeah but not the, as a grown-up i did one cruiser. royal caribbean as and a teenager it was so fun i loved it it was one week but it was like a week-long party but just that, so if you had a week to kill on a vacation would a cruise be something you guys would think about? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> See? But, but you go to... You go Someone to, is thinking that. Yeah. Well, Charlie Pellet's thinking that. Charlie Pellet is a big-time uh, cruise guy. So, But I just... I think the fascinating... I think it's fascinating, the economics of that business, but it's been... Talk about pent-up demand. You know? Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, as you said, that's consumer discretionary right there. Um, yeah, I mean, so then branching into what we're looking at in the broader economy... Um, you know, you would also, you're also probably keeping an eye on the Fed minutes coming out later today. Um, any thoughts on what the Fed might think of, like, the consumer right now and other expectations ahead of that? It'll be interesting to see. I mean, in terms of the market perspective, we don't typically see a big market reaction to the minutes because it's so backward-looking. I'm sure you on the economy side have more, um, you know, to do on the days when the minutes come out. But I am looking to see if they comment on what exactly happened in the interperiod that they did not choose to hike? And now that the market is perhaps expecting another hike in July, what exactly has transpired? And are we going to see this pattern of one hike 
and then a pause, and then a hike, and then a pause, or are we really going to see a period of sustained um, pausing of aggressive monetary policy tightening? So I'll be watching that. But in terms of the market reaction, I'm not sure if there'll be any big moves. I think I'm kind of surprised. I don't know if you are. I don't know what you're hearing on the street. I'm surprised at how well the equity markets have been performing mm -hmm. This year in particular, but certainly Absolutely. in the face of rising rates. And now we've got a Fed that says basically, we're not done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that recession risk, it just keeps getting priced out. I had one source tell me, we can't always have a recession six months away. Because right. we keep hearing that and we keep understanding that the recession is just not quite here. And now I'm having sources say, maybe we're not going to get it. Maybe we truly are going to have that Fed engineer a soft landing, and that's why the equity market has been so resilient thus far. I mean, you see the, I don't know, we're going to have another jobs number on Friday, you know, 225,000 incremental or additional jobs. Yes, that's down sharply from last month, mm -hmm. but still, we're basically at full employment. Right. So I, I'm not, I just could never, you know, kind of circle that square about how you can get a, any meaningful or prolonged recession if everybody's market. got a job and then right. wages are going up for. Four, four and a half percent. We've had 14 straight payroll beats. There's an amazing chart floating around the Bloomberg terminal of the upside surprises in jobs, and it's just a large streak yep. of upside surprises. So it'll be interesting to see what happens on Friday if we get a 15th upside surprise in those numbers. All right, Emily, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate getting a quick checkup on these markets. The S&P 500 off just about one uh, tenth of one percent. UPS, United Parcel Service. Uh, the stock is up, but it's off two and a quarter percent today. It's only up about three percent year to date. 155 billion dollar market cap, but we got some problems there potentially later this month uh, with the labor contract there. Kriti Gupta, markets editor and host of Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, she joins us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker yeah. Studio. Kriti, what are you looking at at UPS? Tell, talk to us about the labor situation there. Oh, there's so much going on. Look, uh, remember when last fall we had those massive rail strikes where yep. the essentially the government had to get involved and say, look, we're shutting down these negotiations because you clearly can't seem to come to some sort of reasonable conclusion. Well, it looks like we're on the cusp of that happening again, except this time with UPS, uh, the shares are down about 2.2% in the pre-market. Over the weekend, they were supposed to have some pretty good negotiations, and they were, they were going well until now. Uh, okay. It looks like they've collapsed. And, and what's important to keep in mind here is that the contract is coming up pretty quickly to end. So July 31st is when it ends. And, and this is why we care. 330,000 workers wow. in this country. This is the largest private sector union agreement. That's the reporting that country. got my attention. I didn't yeah. think about that, but... It's massive. Yes, it is. It's okay. even bigger than the rail strikes. Ah, okay. um, and, and this has even has a, a bigger implication for supply chains. Imagine the folks who can't who can't get their packages. Um, so, so that's kind of what we're dealing with here. They're going through the nitty-gritty. It looks like the union itself has walked away from talks this time around, but um, some pretty, pretty huge implications that this market is really reacting to. Yeah, I wanted to ask you more about the supply chain there, Creedy. Yeah. So, of course, like no one wants to get their packages late. That's yeah. frustrating. We all experienced that during COVID, but what, is there like a bigger takeaway here, a bigger problem besides delays? There is a bigger problem. Look, so so the the way to think about the shipping industry right now is everyone's kind of tackling a little bit differently. There's three different players here. There's UPS, FedEx, DHL, and they all kind of do a little bit of everything. Um, so they will take your package or a business's package or a freight package via plane, train, automobile, throwing a ship in there. Um, and, and what's important to keep in mind is that FedEx and DHL have taken a very different approach than UPS has. Post-pandemic, when everyone was kind of uh, paying top dollar to, to get their shipments, FedEx and DHL really invested in their labor. And that's something that FedEx is now paying for. They're saying, we overhired, now we're pulling back. So you see all these layoffs. DHL, they're not doing layoffs, but they are kind of dealing with that uh, crunch now that packages are declining through kind of attrition. And they're saying, we're just not going to replace roles. Uh, UPS is a completely different ballgame because they never invested in labor in the first place. And that's a big problem. And a big part of that was because they're unionized, whereas uh, FedEx has more kind of an independent contractor network, which they are kind of now dealing with as well. UPS said, we're going to focus on margins. We're going to increase prices. They're going to focus on the smaller consumer and make up our margins from there. And you really saw that strategy work because if you look at the stock of the three companies, UPS has won out. They've outperformed over and over and over again, except now because of those margins, they're saying, look, we can't pay up. Whereas the union is saying, 
well, our wages aren't rising in line with profits, so why should we work if we're not getting that? So they are making some concessions, UPS, to, to these drivers of things like part-time drivers changing a little bit of shift. They're now getting MLK Day as a paid holiday. Um, no more mandatory overtime. Uh, there's no two-tier system anymore. Basically, part-time workers were making about $5 less an hour than full-time workers. So there are pieces of the equation, but it's still not at the salary level that a lot of these workers want. Well, I mean, the old contract, full-time, they can make up to $39 per hour. Mm -hmm. That seems like a good number, but yeah. are they saying, yeah, but you guys, being the company, made so much money during the pandemic, we want some of that? Pretty much. And look, it's also because of the overtime policy, because a lot of these kind of shipping constraints require some of these workers to to go overtime. And I think it's better, perhaps, because from an hourly perspective, $39 an hour sounds pretty juicy. Let's talk about it from an annual okay. uh, perspective. Full-time delivery drivers making about 95000 a year, even though they're doing it through kind of rain, hail, storm, through COVID, through all of these true. kind of issues. Yep. Um, did, they ever, did they ever get anything for... COVID, working through COVID? They didn't. And this is, I think, where a lot of the parallels with the rail worker story came. Because remember, for the rail strikes uh, last fall, they weren't getting uh, paid time off. They weren't getting uh, sick leave, for example. They weren't even getting access to benefits. So it's a lot of these same issues. Essentially, these are industries, rail or shipping, that are very intensive. Truck drivers really have to take, have to kind of sacrifice a lot physically, but also um, in terms of family and, and how much time they get off as well. So they want to be compensated for it, especially with the overtime. And, and I think that's where they're struggling here. And, and they're basically saying, look, we've, we've made some concessions, but really you got to meet us on the pay, and UPS just isn't budging here. Yeah, I saw it with the West Coast dock workers, too, even more right. recently yeah. this spring. And as you mentioned, you know, the, the government did have to intervene at that. Right. Um, well, we all think a lot of us probably remember Joe Biden taking a nice trip out there <laughs> yeah. to visit. <laughs> and, and I'll say this is an, really quickly, this is an international story, too, because Canada also now dealing with, with port strikes as well. So you're seeing this all over, I want to say, the world. What's UPS saying? Are they? What's their bargaining position? Are they saying we pay competitively? What's what, what are they saying here? So UPS is saying that, look, we are negotiating. We've already made a lot of concessions, which, to be fair, they have a uh, normal mandatory overtime. They've changed their two-tier payment system. But they're saying that the Teamsters kind of have to give uh, some sort of leeway here. And if you look at this last round of negotiations, which collapsed this morning, by the way, mm. uh, they're saying that the Teamsters are the ones who walked away from, from the bargaining table. So you have to, they're saying you have to continue this dialogue. Um, of course, we're going to keep you updated on, because this is not over yet, but... but We'll see how this goes. What have we heard from the administration? Is like I haven't heard anything like President Biden talking about this. Is this just because Not we've much. got you know three weeks to go before it really gets pretty much? Down? Look, I don't. I think the Biden administration and Molly, correct me if I'm wrong. You're, you're on the economics team. Um, they really want to not intervene until they really have to. When you saw this with the rail strike, I keep bringing this back to the rail strikes because we just went through this a couple of months ago. Marty Walsh, uh, the labor secretary at the time got involved at the very last minute. And it ended up being because Congress uh, had to intervene. It was some sort of very old rail law from yep. like 1912 yeah. yep. that only applied to rail for, for some reason. Um, and, and that's what they ended up instigating. But you kind of want to make this work on its own before the Biden administration gets involved, especially because of the political consequences. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, that is definitely the you know 11th hour Hail Mary. Yeah. We need to call in the top guns <laughs> to make this happen. Right. So um, yeah, it doesn't seem like we're quite there yet, but uh, certainly would be concerning over the next three weeks um, if we if it does escalate to that point. It does is there an indication that this could be drawn out for it could till the end? it could. So I think what, what was it, what was kind of the difference? Again, I'm going to bring it back to the real strikes because it's a little bit of deja vu here. Is that the voting periods were longer? So you had kind of okay, well, we're going to go till the eleventh hour, and then we're going to have three or six weeks to vote, and then come back. So it was kind of a drawn out process specifically because of that law that dated back to like 1912 or whatever. This time around, that's not true. It has been voted 97% by the union that if this agreement isn't hit by July 31st, which is when the contract ends, August 1st, they are going on strike. So we're still about two, three weeks away, but it's certainly something you want to keep an eye on because there is no long drawn out process here. Uh, it's, it's very simple. And Marty Walsh is not going to come in and save the day because he is no longer the Secretary of Labor. Yeah. I'm just looking up. He's the director of the National Hockey League Players Association. Oh, yeah. He, he traded so, up. <laughs> okay. Um, interesting. All right. So UPS will keep on the lookout for that because who doesn't receive a package every day at home? I mean, 
yeah. every day. So, and I'll give you an added piece of, of of kind of trivia here. One of UPS's biggest customers is Amazon. So Amazon mm -hmm. has their own logistics company, but their kind of leftover goes through UPS. Really? Because again, I see the Amazon trucks everywhere now. Yeah. I mean, they they've got to be. I have to ask Lee Claskow, this at Bloomberg Intelligence. They got to be one of the biggest trucking companies in the country. Now. Amazon. Yeah. I think they're be. headed that way. They're yeah, headed that way. It's extraordinary. All right, Kriti Gupta, thanks so much uh, for joining us. Kriti Gupta, uh, markets reporter, does all that. Bloomberg TV stuff. We appreciate getting some reporting there on UPS. Again, huge company. I didn't know this. The largest private sector union um, uh, agreement there is the Teamsters with UPS. So we'll keep an eye on that. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's get some company news right now with Steve Rappaport. Good morning. Netflix stock is higher after Goldman Sachs upgraded the streaming service to neutral. Analysts at the firm say Netflix management implemented its password sharing crackdown more efficiently than expected, and they predict the positive momentum to continue into next year. A marathon negotiation session between UPS and unionized workers fails to produce a deal. Bloomberg's Jeff Bellinger reports. Steve, the two sides worked late into the night before the Teamsters say discussions collapsed around 4 o'clock this morning. The Teamsters tweeted that UPS walked away from the table after presenting what the union called an unacceptable offer that did not address members' needs. UPS says it is proud of the offer it made and it did not walk away. It is urging the Teamsters to resume talks. The current labor agreement covering about 330,000 UPS Jeff. workers expires And July let's talk 31st. ice cream. Ben and Jerry's. Teamsters Paul, are you a favorite? Absolutely. Oh, yeah? Well, what's your jam? Uh, oh, I'm just chocolate. I'm old school. You're old school. Well, yep. you might not like this. Ben and Jerry stirred up some controversy with a tweet on Independence Day writing, this land was founded by and stolen by in indigenous people on this 4th of July. Let's commit to returning it. Hmm. Some All tweeters right. were calling for a boycott of the popular ice cream. One even referred to the Ben and Jerry's brand as the Bud Light of ice cream. Oh, that'd be tough. So is this going to make you... Buy any no, more or I less? could care less. Just give me my ice cream. All right. Those are the company stories we're following this hour. I'm Steve Rappaport. This is Bloomberg. Stay tuned for more Bloomberg Markets coming up next. a day at Bloomberg.com on Bloomberg Television and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom with this Bloomberg Business Flash. Uh, you had weak services uh, figures out of China that raised some concerns about the outlook for the global economy. 
And then you toss into the mix uh, the fact that UPS drivers, they could be close to going on strike this after the uh, talk with the Teamsters seems to have fallen apart. So that's threatening to disrupt the uh, U.S. supply chain at this point. It does make for some mixed sentiment today. Still, you have uh, technology shares. They're holding up. Meta platforms, Alphabet shares, they're higher. And among the best performers right now in the S&P 500, best performing individual stock in the index that belongs to Moderna. They're going to try to push toward producing messenger RNA vaccines for China. And then you have Disney. Those shares are lower. The latest Indiana Jones film looks like a flop. A oh, flop. Like, Not my word. Bloomberg uh, Intelligence uses that well, word. Well, Geetha's, yeah, she's tough. You know, I didn't see it. 82 million bucks, it's not terrible, I don't think. But well, what consider do I know? how much they spent I know, the I know, thing. I know. But how many Indiana Joneses do we need? Uh, not this many, apparently. <laughs> S&P 500 right now, four points lower. That's down a tenth of a percent. Dow Jones Industrial Average, 125 points lower. That's down four tenths of a percent. The NASDAQ 100 right now is up 45 points. That is a rise of three tenths of a percent. We check the markets for you all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Molly and Paul. All right, John Tucker, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Molly Smith, Paul Sweeney here in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Smith, not the given name. You guys came to Ellis Island and they switched it on you. You made it Smith, right? I am so grateful because, as John just said, it really is a great radio name. <laughs> it's the perfect, it's almost as good as John Tucker. Almost. Yeah, you know? All right. Molly Smith. Though there is not a movie, call, uh, to my knowledge, called Molly Smith Must Die. Let's hope not. I hope not. Do you know how many times I get that <laughs> a day? John Tucker Must Die. I forgot all about that. All right. Oh, great one. Another. I thought Charlie Pellet was our famous uh, Bloomberg radio person, but apparently they got a movie about John Tucker. Go figure. <laughs> all right, let's get right down to it here. Lots of economic data coming out this week. We got a Fed, uh, you know, going to be making some decision later on here in the month. So that means we need to check in with Ira Jersey. He does all of that interest rate stuff for Bloomberg Intelligence, uh, chief U.S. interest rate strategist. Ira, thanks so much for joining us here via Zoom. Here, um, give us a sense of, I don't know, where the Fed is leaning. Uh, let, let's start this way. Here's my my question about the Fed, and I just I've been asking it from for some smart people, the, and this is not a smart question, the optics of it. It just doesn't look good. When my Fed is raising interest rates every single quarter, over 500 basis points, then it pauses, because maybe that's what you do after you've raised rates so much. Are they really going to get back on and start raising rates again? Does yeah, the optics it seems look weird? Like it seems like they really want to, Paul. And and it, you know they they made it pretty clear at the last meeting that um, that that they still want to be hawkish. They wanted to make sure that the market knew that if nothing else, they weren't cutting interest rates too early. So I, I think the bar at this point is actually reasonably uh, um, the the bar for them to to hike is actually very low. So you you really as long as you don't have like an absolutely crazy low employment number, if you don't have wages that you know fall significantly more than than the market. It expects and 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 if we if we get anywhere near consensus CPI uh, report, um, then I think the Fed's going to hike. I, I think it's that second Fed hike that the DOPS suggested might occur. That's much more in doubt at this point because you you are seeing a moderation of inflation, just not as quickly as they want. So um, th so I think that was a signal that. Uh, that was signaling a little bit more that the Fed wants to be hawkish if they need to be. Um, so, 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 yeah. So this month, I, I think that they'll hike. You know, you know the market, the, the market is now almost fully priced for that, and also priced for some some chance of a uh, of a second hike as well. So, so, so the market's already there, regardless. So, so you won't see any more, you know, major moves unless the data really shocks one way or the other. Yeah, so Ira, we've heard from Powell as well as a few other Fed speakers uh, since that June meeting, and I think the market is still fairly confused as to what's going on here. <laughs> um, do we really think the minutes are going to give the, the answer that everyone's been looking for? I, I think that the minutes are going to be probably pretty mixed. You know, interestingly, even though the dot plot and, and some of the rhetoric out of Jay Powell at the last press conference, overall, our, our natural language processing model suggested that actually. Whoa, 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 is, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's, let's take a step back. I know 
you're a model geek. You have a natural, what, what is it again, a language model? Natural language processing. So, so we oh, take boy. every sentence uh, within the opening remarks of, the, uh, uh, of Chair Powell's opening statement at the press conference and then try to determine whether or not that statement is, is hawkish or dovish, mm. modestly hawkish or modestly dovish, and then we, we combine that into, into an index. And what, what we actually found was that, that he was still pretty neutral uh, overall. So he was pretty balanced in talking both hawkish and dovish, even though um, the dots and, and some of his rhetoric suggested that, that the Fed's going to hike again. Um, now, the, the fact that they're going to hike again doesn't mean that they're you know going to hike another 150 or 200 basis points. So it kind of makes sense that, yes, they're getting to the top of the cycle. The question is that they're trying to calibrate exactly where they think the Fed funds uh, rate should be in order for inflation to continue to come down and maybe come down a little bit faster than it has in the recent past. Mm, yeah. So, so you. So it sounds like, like you said, July seems almost like a given at this point. And Powell even said, you know, he would not rule out consecutive hikes um, at you know concurrent meetings. So, do we are we already maybe even thinking what's the bar for September? Yeah, I, I think we do have to think about what the bar for September would be. And I think that bar is higher than than the bar for, for July. Um, and it's also one of the reasons why. So so, so a, a very smart investor actually suggested this. And, and this is an interesting concept was that the Fed was hiking at 75s and they hiking in, then they were hiking in 50s and they were hiking in 25s. Now they might be hiking in 12 and a halves. Um, and in order and, and the Fed doesn't do that. Right. They're not the Bank of Japan hiking in um, in, in decimals. So so uh, so. Basically, every other meeting, uh, they could be hiking in quarter point increments. And again, it, it makes sense in that regard from because it's they're in because they're in this calibration mode. Um, you know, they they don't want to go too fast, and they also want to have the ability to stop hiking at any moment, um, which was harder to do when they were hiking at 50s. Right now that they're hiking in 25s, they've skipped now a meeting. Um, it, it makes it a little bit easier for them to to do that calibration. And nobody knows, right? So the problem is is that ex ante, it's difficult to know exactly exactly where the Fed funds rate should be. Um, I think that they've probably done enough in order for inflation to come down. Now they just need to give it time to, to occur. Um, but they don't see it that way. And, and you know, until they, they wind up with a, with a real funds rate that is, you know, significantly higher than, than headline inflation, um, they're, they're going to still think about hiking, even if they actually uh, don't do it every meeting. All right. Uh, Lisa Brahman says, I have to ask this question. She just emailed in from her vacation. Yield curve still inverted 103 basis points. Do we care? Do you care? What's the market telling you? Yeah, it's just telling us. Um, it's just telling us that the that the the market is expecting the uh, interest rates to be lower in the future. I mean, that, that's the whole reason why you get inversions in the yield curve is just the expectation that yes, we're going to have five percent interest rates now, but we might have three percent interest rates, you know, two or three, four years from now. And because of that, you get this inversion of the yield curve. You know, the fact that it's lasted now for for the better part of, of eighteen months, um, it, you know, does suggest that the market thinks that we we might be heading into a recession, or if not a recession, then, then at least a very significant reduction in inflation over the over the medium term. And, and uh, um, it, it, you know, at some point, we're going to start to really uninvert quite aggressively, I think. But um, the, the timing of that is probably not until it's very clear that the Federal Reserve's done hiking. Um, until then, the two-year yield is probably going to keep on hovering, you know, kind of just a little bit below um, where where the high the highest uh, Fed funds rate might actually be, you know, and it really took until the last Fed meeting for the market expectations to kind of be more in sync with what Powell and the Fed have been saying. Uh, looking at the world interest rate probability function now on the terminal, um, you know, it looks like those you know prop those expectations for rate cuts this year dramatically have come down. So. You know, what is, does the market have some of that natural language processing model that you do, or what, what is it that they finally believe the Fed? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that that a lot of people thought that the Fed didn't have the resolve to continue um, to hike interest rates beyond uh, beyond June. So you you had a lot of people thinking, oh, the the economy is going to fall fall apart. They've hiked 500 basis points. We're going to wind up seeing a recession later this year. Um, but a lot of the data that's been coming in suggests that even if we do have a recession, it'll be very shallow and won't necessarily be enough to pull inflation down significantly more. So therefore, the Federal Reserve is is not going to be cut 
cutting interest rates later this year. Now, now keep in mind that that is not that we've priced out cuts. We actually still have a cut priced for uh, for six months from now, right? So, so the market keeps pricing for a cut six months after the last hike, a cut six months after last hike. The problem is, is that we've pulled forward now uh, when that last hike is going to be, because now if the last hike is in July, then they're going to wind up, you know, the first cut is now priced for January. And then if they, you know, wind up hiking again in September, like Paul was suggesting, if that happens, then maybe the first cut's not priced then until March. So it's always this kind of rolling six-month right. window for uh, for the first cut. Ira, Molly and I, let's be honest, we're focused entirely on Wimbledon for the next two weeks. But if I had a spare moment, is there anything in the world of soccer that we should be paying attention to? Uh, well, the, the Gold Cup's going on right now. We're in the semifinals uh, or quarterfinals, excuse me. So the U.S. plays Canada. And uh, and, and you have to – later this month starts the Women's World Cup out in uh, New Zealand and Australia. So uh, the, the roster drops for that are uh, – uh, are pretty interesting, you know. Especially in the U.S., we have a lot of younger uh, younger women who are going to be headed down to uh, uh, to down under to play some football. All right, good stuff. You ask a question, you'll get an answer from this guy. Thank Ira you. Jersey, uh, uh, he is our soccer guru. He's off of our. I think he does interest rates and stuff like that for Bloomberg Intelligence. That's what gets the paycheck, so I'm told. So he is our go-to guy on the Fed and on uh, global soccer as well. So, uh, again, we'll keep an eye on that. S&P 500 basically unchanged on the day. Uh, we got the Dow off about four-tenths of 1%. That's 125 points for those of you keeping score at home. Right now, let's head down to Washington, D.C. we got World International News from Nathan Hagen. All right, Paul, thank you. The U.S. Navy is accusing Iran of trying to seize two oil tankers near the Strait of Hormuz this morning. A spokesman for the Navy's Fifth Fleet says Iran fired shots at one of the vessels before the U.S. stepped in and allowed those ships to go on their way. The Navy says Iran has seized at least five commercial vessels in the last two years and harassed several others, many in or around the Strait of Hormuz. Israel has pulled troops out of a militant stronghold in the West Bank after its most intense operation in nearly two decades. Twelve Palestinians and one Israeli soldier were killed in that two-day raid on the Janine refugee camp. The Israeli army says it inflicted heavy damage on militant groups, but Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is vowing to carry out similar operations if needed. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen leaves for China today on a four-day mission to try to find common economic ground while continuing to de-risk from the world's second largest economy. Greg Vallier, chief U.S. policy strategist at AGF Investments, says just talking could be a win. She really wants to get a dialogue going, not that she's going to concede uh, on every issue. Uh, and I do think that they will agree when she leaves in a communique for more talks this fall, leading to a summit between Joe Biden and Z uh, toward the end of the year. AGF's Greg Valliere spoke on Bloomberg Daybreak. This trip follows China putting new export controls on two metals that are key to many aspects of the tech industry. Ukraine and Russia are pointing fingers over the threat of an attack on Europe's largest nuclear plant. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky is repeating his warning that Russia could be planning to sabotage the Zelensky. Zaporizhia facility that it's occupied in the country's south since the start of the war. The Kremlin is accusing Kiev of planning a provocation. U.N. inspectors say they've seen no evidence of anti-personnel mines, but they are continuing to monitor the situation at Zaporizhia. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Nathan Hager. This is Bloomberg.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business app. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom with this Bloomberg Business Flash. Right now, the major averages, uh, they are mixed. In the S&P 500, you have nine of the 11 major industry groups lower. Technology is in the lead. The best performing industry groups belong to communication services. Uh, that's where you're going to find meta platforms and alphabet. And information technology, that's where Microsoft lives. Uh, meantime, after ripping higher so far this year, equity strategist Jonathan Stubbs at Berenberg says equities will now struggle. Now, looking ahead of the second quarter, uh, we need a new narrative or we need an extension of that. We find that hard to see here. So perhaps instead of the, the dip and rip, the, we get the rip and dip. Uh, shares of Tesla, most active, up about uh, two-tenths of a percent right now. Tesla's China's uh, deliveries, they're surging. And Bloomberg Intelligence writing today that easing inflation pressures, minor job losses so far, and the read from our economic regime model all remain supportive for equities. S&P 500 right now, three points lower at 44.52 on the index. Dow Jones Industrial Average is down 115 points right now, 34,304. The Nasdaq 100, 56 points higher. That's a four-tenths of a percent. And we check the markets for you all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker, and that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Molly and Paul. All right, John Tucker, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Molly Smith, Paul Sweeney here in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Boy, you think about 2022. That was just ugly for asset allocators. That 60-40 portfolio uh, did not work out at all for anybody. So you think about here. Year to date, 2023, heck of a first half uh, when you look at uh, particularly equity, equity markets, but also fixed income. So, brings into question asset allocation. What do you do here in the second half of the year going into uh, 2024? Uh, Fortunately, our next guest does that stuff for a living, Nimrit Kang, co CIO, senior portfolio manager at uh, North Star Asset Management. He gets his chemical engineering degree. I mean, who does that at Virginia Tech? Really good tech school. Then he gets an MBA from some trade school up in Boston. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, Nimrit, thanks so much for joining us here. Um, asset allocation, where are you guys these days uh, after what's been, a, I think, for a lot of people, a surprisingly strong first half of the year? Yeah, thank you for having me. Yes, going into 2023, we were very cautious uh, on the markets. You know, like everyone else, we expected this uh, lag between monetary policy and economic effects. Which has, uh, it, which is really still missing in action. Equity markets have been strong. We had been underweight equities um, going into 2023, and we remain underweight um, equities slightly versus targets. And the reason there is that um, just history shows there are considerable lags between monetary policy and economic effects. We have never had this kind of steep rise in um, interest rates over such a short period. Yes, we've seen some effects of that from the regional bank crisis to you know the bursting of the crypto assets, but we think these are effects that are gonna bear out over a much longer time. And in general, we just feel like we're in this um, period where you know a lot of uh, um, people are calling this a poly crisis age. There are a number of things that are coming together. But generally, all that means is higher level of uncertainty and volatility in the markets. That to us just says that, you know, we just need to be very risk aware and focused on running very diversified portfolios for our clients. When I hear asset allocators talk about higher volatility, it sounds like more opportunities. So where are you finding those pockets right now to invest in? Yeah, yeah, no, really um, good question. So when we think about higher volatility, of course, you know, right away we think about just going back to the basics, investing in those companies where we have pretty strong conviction on the cash flows going forward. And if we have conviction on the strong cash flows and we don't pay too much for those stocks, we know that over the longer time, those companies are going to hold up both in down markets and up markets. They can be both offensive and defensive holdings. And then, of course, in the fixed income side, we are taking the opportunity to extend 
um, maturities for our clients getting locking in higher interest rates where we can. And if down the road there is an end to this monetary tightening po uh, cycle and we do see interest rates come down, there is that appreciation potential as well. Nimrod, I'd love to get some thoughts on the equity space here. What are some names that you're looking at? What are some themes that you guys pursue when, you, when you're looking to you know, invest on the uh, equity side? Absolutely. So the way we build our portfolios is we've, uh, it's intersection of a number of different factors, but really our process starts with identifying some of those long-term societal challenges that we feel um, are going to need a tremendous innovation to solve. So for example, we have been in that digital transformation space for a while, and you know we did not expect this new boom coming from artificial intelligence that has basically been the big story for 2023. But several of those companies have been benefiting from that. You know, that's your Bellwether, Microsoft, Adobe, CRM, all those types of stocks. So that's a theme that's been in the portfolio for a while. We just see that these companies are going to continue to solve the problem related to productivity, labor productivity, and some of the other challenges that we see. But then on the other side, there are other examples. For example, you know, the, all the challenges related to climate change and some of the things that we're coming to see, they're coming together very quickly relating to, you know, very high temperatures, hotter uh, summers, droughts, floods, all types of issues that we're seeing there. Some of the companies that we think are going to be at the forefront of challenging them, especially related to water efficiency. You know, lately we've heard a lot about the uh, Colorado River levels drying up, creating all kinds of challenges there. We have been investing in a number of stocks. There's some smaller cap companies that are not your household names like Badger Meter or Xylem. These companies provide instruments, meters, valves, uh, all kinds of other solutions to help drive water conservation, measurement, and efficiency. And we think the demand for those products and solutions is only going to increase over time. So Nimrit, you're just saying that you came into 2023 underweight equities. Um, looking at the S&P 500, it's up 16% year to date. Are you rethinking going into the second half of the year if that's still where you want to be or sticking to your guns and that and those lags are going to kick in? Yes, yes. So, you know, it's interesting. There's an adage in the stock market, nobody knows nothing, right? And 2023 <laughs> definitely proved that by spades. If you had asked anyone, it was interesting. I was reviewing my notes and across the board, you know, there's no way you can have continue to have the kind of interest rate normalization going on as we did like 500 basis points on the low end over the last 18 months and not have a major slowdown in that economy. Yet the economy has defied all those odds so far, especially the resiliency of the economy. So I think there's so many different puts and takes that are affecting the economy in general. It's hard to really understand when that inflection point happens between the negatives, i.e. the credit um, tightening cycle that we're expecting, just you know, the pressure overall, going from a very easy monetary policy, an era, almost a decade, more than a decade of where there was basically money, there was no cost related to money, to actually having higher interest rates, that's a sizable shift in regime. I was just uh, reading a study which showed that one third of an increase in profit margins for S&P 500 has come from lower interest rates and reduced taxes. Nothing about the taxes yet, but we know interest rates are definitely changing. So when we look further out, it's hard to ascertain when that inflection does happen, but it's hard to imagine that we will not start to see some impact from this type of a sea change in monetary policy. That's just really on the financial side. Now, let me talk about some of the social issues that we're talking about. Right. Yes, you know, despite all the different things that we're talking about, economic inclusion is probably at its lowest levels that we right. have seen. It's harder and harder for low-income families to meet daily needs. How does that all translate yep. into the broad-based ramifications? So when we put all that together, Molly, we're still 
staying underweight equities. And All again, right. staying underweight, but remaining very much invested in yep. these high quality names. All right, Nimrit, thank you so much for joining us. Nimrit Kang, co-CIO and senior portfolio manager at North Star uh, Asset Management, joining us. This is Bloomberg. Let's get some company news right now. Steve Rappaport. Paul, Tesla deliveries in China are surging as concerns about supply chain issues, the impact of COVID-19, and weak consumer demand begin to fade. Tesla's Shanghai plant delivered more than 93,000 vehicles in June, nearly 20% up from the same time last year. Shares of Tesla currently down less than a quarter of a percent. Make way for another platform in the social media sphere. Meta is preparing to roll out its Threads app tomorrow, Bloomberg's Ed Baxter reports. Threads is aimed to be a direct competitor to Twitter. U.S. and U.K. app stores already have some pre-order options up. European Union is experiencing some problems, though, with no Threads as of late yesterday, including Germany and Belgium. Ireland's Protection Commission says the service will not be rolled out in the EU for the time being for some kind of security negotiations. Meta says it plans to roll out ultimately in more than 100 countries, but has not published a list as of yet. In San Francisco, I'm Ed Baxter, Bloomberg Radio. Thanks, Ed. In other Twitter news, the TweetDeck app won't be free for much longer. Starting next month, only paid verified users will have access to TweetDeck. And American Equity Investment accepts a $4.3 billion cash and stock takeover from a division of Canadian investment giant Brookfield. Brookfield Reinsurance will buy shares for $55 a share, and that offer represents a 35% premium to American Equity closing price. That was the last full day. That was in back on June 23rd, the last full day before Bloomberg revealed Brookfield's interest in that deal. Shares of American equity now currently up more than 1.5%. I'm Steve Rappaport, and this is Bloomberg.
You're listening to Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Index. Thank you very much there, Sebastian. Looking at these indexes, as Matt Miller would say, as opposed to indices, I don't see the difference. But anyway, in any case, S&P 500 down about one-tenth of one percent. Uh, NASDAQ absolutely unched on the day. Uh, yields, uh, a little bit of movement there. Kind of mixed the two-year treasuries off two basis points, 4.91 percent. How about that? The 10 years up three, three basis points, 3.88 percent. So that really noticeable inversion continues negative 103 basis points. Oil getting a little bit of a lift here yet again. WTI crude oil up 2 percent, $71.00. Twenty-seven cents. We'll keep an eye on that. Uh, OPEC Plus continuing their production cuts for, I guess, at least another month. All right, right now, let's head down to Washington, D.C. We get World and National News with Nathan Hayes. Paul, the nation's coming off a rash of deadly mass shootings over the long Fourth of July weekend. Today, the man accused of killing five people and wounding two others in Philadelphia the day before the fourth is expected in court. District Attorney Larry Krasner lays out the charges against that 40-year-old suspect. We'll be facing multiple counts of murder, and we'll also be facing uh, multiple counts of aggravated assault as a first-degree felony, weapons charges, among others. DA Larry Krasner, that shooting came on the same day of another deadly mass killing in Fort Worth, Texas. Overnight here in Washington, D.C., nine people were wounded in a drive-by at a 4th of July party. In the wake of all these incidents, President Biden put out a statement urging Congress to come to the table on sensible gun restrictions. We should note that Michael Bloomberg, the founder majority owner of Bloomberg Radio's parent company, Bloomberg LP, donates to groups that support gun control. More than 300,000 UPS workers are a step closer to a strike. Bloomberg's Amy Morris has more from Washington. Weeks-long talks between UPS and the Teamsters fell apart early this morning in Washington after stretching through the July 4th holiday. Negotiators left the meeting just after 4 this morning to say the talks had collapsed. Teamsters say the company walked out. UPS is encouraging Teamsters to return to the table. There's still time to reach a deal. The current labor contract expires at the end of this month, but without a deal, union employees will not work after July 31st, and no more bargaining sessions are scheduled. In Washington, I'm Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. Harvard University's legacy admissions are under more pressure. There's been a bill just introduced in Massachusetts that would tax rich colleges that favor the children of alumni and donors in admissions decisions and give that money to poor community colleges. This comes after the Supreme Court's decision to all but shut down race-based affirmative action in college admissions decisions across the country. Minority groups have accused Harvard of violating federal law with policies that favor legacies. There's been another disruption at Wimbledon. Two activists with the group Just Stop Oil were arrested. They ran onto one of the courts and threw orange graffiti on the grass. Play at Court 18 was suspended by rain, before that debris could be cleared away, the All England Club had already boosted security after protests at other major sports venues across the UK this year. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Nathan Hager in Washington. This is Bloomberg, Paul and Molly. All right, Nathan Hager, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Uh, Molly Smith, Paul Sweeney here in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. It is Wimbledon time. I'm all in Wimbledon. It looks great on TV. I love watching it. Talk to me about the state of women's tennis in the U.S. Yeah, so it's um, it's kind of we're at this like interesting point right now because, you know, Serena has retired. Yep. I'm stunned that Venus hasn't. Right. She did play. She lost in her first round. Um, honestly, amazing. Yes. She's 43 out here still doing it. But there are some younger players that are coming up. I know we've been saying this for years. Where are they? Who are yeah. they? But I th I really do feel good about the state where things are right now. Um. We've got Jesse Pegula and Coco Goff both in the top 10. Of course, Coco did lose in the first round as well, but to another American, actually. Sophia okay. Kennan, who won the 2020 Australian Open, she's on the comeback trail from a few injuries. And um, I think I think the field is in good shape. We've got some up-and-comers on the men's side, too. So it's just, um, look, these may not be, you know, the household names that McEnroe, Sampras, Agassi have been over the years, but uh, I, I feel good about where it's shaping up. for the up. women, I mean, you look at the top 25 seeds, there's only, they're all Russian or Eastern European, it seems like. That's where the money's at right now. That's where they're investing a lot yeah. more heavily than we are. All right. Yeah. All right. We'll keep an eye on it. I'm a big fan of Wimbledon. Yeah, I'm getting psyched for the U.S. Open. Got my tickets uh, for the first Tuesday, uh, which will be good. We have more coming up. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney. We got a lot of green on the screen here, but the volume is light. This is a market that's much more optimistic or bullish than maybe the central bankers are. 9.5 million job openings. What are people doing? Are they just sitting in Starbucks all day? Breaking market news and insight from Bloomberg experts. There's still some concern out there in the market that there is room for things to deteriorate a little bit more than what they're indicating. As small and medium-sized businesses struggle, they don't present as much competition. What are you guys thinking about hardware, software? How should investors approach this thing called AI. This is Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. All right, coming up in this hour, we're going to get the latest on the markets with one Vince Signorelli. He's a macro strategist at Bloomberg. And then we're going to do a little roundtable on the global energy business. We can do that with a couple smart voices. Mike McGlone, he's a senior macro strategist with Bloomberg Intelligence. And Fernando Valle, he's a senior global energy analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. We're going to talk about global oil. Where are we going from here? Supply and demand, all that good stuff. And then we're going to check in with Jerry Smith. He's a media reporter at Bloomberg News. Uh, he's got a very interesting uh, story about Amazon weighing the cost of the TV business. And then I want to ask him about ESPN. What's Disney going to do with ESPN? Is there a spin out there? Are they going all streaming? A lot to talk about with Jerry. But first, let's kick it all off with John Tucker and get a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, guys. The uh, major averages right now, they are mixed. Uh, Tech-heavy NASDAQ 100 in the lead. You have Meta Platforms, NVIDIA driving some of the gains there. Weak data from China weighing on some of the risks. Meantime, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen heading to Beijing this week. And Greg Valliere at AGF Investments says, you know, that trip will produce some positive sentiment. I do think that they will agree when she leaves in a communique for more talks this fall, leading to a summit between Joe Biden and Z uh, toward the end of the year. So I, I think that the bottom line will be that it was a pretty constructive meeting. A monster beverage shares they're higher ahead of their earnings. Bloomberg Intelligence says their earnings per share could jump 50 percent. Uh, and the second quarter appears to have been a pretty good one for automakers. Uh, looking at Toyota right now, motor sales that rose 7.1 percent in the second quarter, and a lot of that coming from sales of Toyota's hybrids. Right now, the S&P 500, three points lower, 44.52 on the index. Dow Jones Industrial Average down 96 points. That's lower by three tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq 100 up 39 points. That is up a quarter of a percent. I always find it instructive to go to uh, the most read stories on the blue. Always, and among them. It's not a market story. Sharks show up in Hamptons as summer <laughs> holiday crowds at beaches. Here's a news flash. Okay. It's the ocean. Sharks yes. live in the ocean. But that's my take anyway. All right. Well, you can't. I mean, I remember just up at Cape Cod when they brought back the seal population. Oh, well, that's the good news. That's the good bad food. news is that attracts sharks. And one of the most beautiful beaches on the Cape is in Chatham. I don't think you've been able to really swim in there for years. And those aren't just any sharks. Those are great white sharks up Oof. there. Those yep. are even worse than your typical shark. Well, the sharks <laughs> Paul and I encounter at the Jersey Shore, like they're like this big. Uh, <laughs> baby sharks, like the song. Yeah, it still oh, hurts no. when they bite you. Baby still sharks. Hurt <laughs> that one. Yeah. Now that's going to be in my head all day. John Tucker, uh, thank you so much. We appreciate it. All right, let's get a look at these markets here. Let's bring on Vince Signorella. He's a macro strategist for uh, Bloomberg. He joins us via Zoom. Hey, Vince, a lot of eco data coming up, a lot of people trying to position for the end of the month where the Fed is going to go. What's your takeaway? What are you looking at in these markets? Well, you know, I think we're seeing just a little bit of overreaction this morning to the data that came out of China. It was a little bit of a slowdown. And, of course, then people think that's going to slow down the rest of the world. And there were some service PMIs out of Europe as well that was slower. I, you know, I think you just... You can't just take one number and and sort of make a case for for the next six months out of it, which it looks like that's what markets are, are, are doing today. So I would I would sort of take it with a grain of salt. We get, as you mentioned, some data next week that's going to be um, more interesting than what we have this week, which is uh, CPI, PPI. We get real average earnings. Um, and export and import that along with the UMISH sentiment index. And that should give us a little bit of a clearer picture on inflation and where consumers see things going. We'll see, you know, the UMISH, um, will that build on the consumer confidence numbers that we saw, which were pretty explosive as of late. For today, we have the FOMC minutes at 2 o'clock, and everyone's hoping to get some clarity on what the hike, skip, pause comments that came from Powell really mean. I don't know that they're really going to see what they're hoping for, but um, we'll find out at 2 o'clock. 
Yeah, we're also going to get a couple more job indicators uh, this week, Vince. And I'm just looking over time right now at the two-year yield, and it looks like we're creeping back up to that level of where it was right before the banking crisis started in early March. Does that say to you from a market perspective that, like, basically never happened, it's a it's a nothing, we can all move on? Or what does it even say to the Fed for that matter? <laughs> I, I think it's just, you know, when you look at the two-year yield, it's, it's, it's just tied to the Fed funds rate. And if if you buy where Powell has been saying recently about at least one, if not two more rate hikes this year, you, you have to move the two-year yield or the two-year bond in sync with where the Fed funds rate is going to be. So we, we should see the two-year uh, trade a little lower if that's the case, uh, if data doesn't upset the, the works of what Powell is thinking. Um, but the, when you look across markets, I think, especially when you look at equities, I think the markets see that as a very temporary phenomenon, and that at some point after those next one or two rate hikes, um, you're really going to see things peak uh, and and uh, rates definitely on the pause and most likely coming in lower next year, even though the Fed has said they don't see rate cuts until 2025. I, I think you have to like take their forecast with a grain of salt because they're just not usually very accurate. Hey, Vince, talk to us about uh, the, the, the dollar here. What's the market pricing in here um, on, on the dollar versus some of the other majors? Yeah, well, you know, again, if you're, if you're buying into the rate hikes for the next, uh, the next like, six months or so, you, the, the dollar is going to be a little bit of a bid. Uh, you definitely, um, the rate differentials uh, between particularly uh, Japan uh, favoring the dollar. I mean, the ECB is still on the rate hike path as well. So that should keep the euro fairly in check with the dollar. But in general, you probably see a little bit of dollar strength, but I think that's going to be short-lived as well. I think, you know, when you go toward the end of this year into next. So as we're looking at, oh, sorry, go ahead, Vince. No, it's okay. I just think we'll see the dollar roll over. That's all. Go, Go ahead. I wanted to ask you then, uh, you know, as we're looking at potentially another rate hike or two this year, we hear a lot about on this show from a lot of our guests talking about these lagged effects of monetary policy and how much time it takes for uh, the rate hikes to trickle through the system. Um, When, you know, what's your take from the market side? Um, You know, have we felt any of it in um, any of the major asset classes and when might, when might we? Well, you know, the, the, the old theory when, when I was flipping through textbooks was six months for it to wend its way through to the economy. Uh, some people are putting in more like 12 and 18 months now. So if you think that the Fed is about a year and change into it, we should start seeing it soon. We're not quite seeing it yet in the housing market. Uh, housing housing still quite uh, high. We're starting to see it in the rental market come down a little bit. So I, I think the lag effect has to come through or that, that – effect of the Fed's monetary policy should easily come through within the next six months. And hopefully that'll that'll push the Fed back a little bit on a on more of a pause state as as they seem to have done enough. And, and as we speak, the ten year yields reaching session highs of three point eight nine percent. So no one's listening to me out there. Um, <laughs> but but I but I think, you know, realistically what if you think about what the Fed has done in such a short period of time, it's an astronomical increase in, in rates and Fed funds rate, and that eventually really has to hit the, hit the economy. All right, Vince, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate getting your thoughts there. Vince Signorello, macro strategist for uh, Bloomberg News, uh, checking in with us uh, from the work from home office. Good for him. All right, let's switch gears. Let's go uh, global energy here. I'm looking at WTI crude oil. It's about 2.2% today, just above uh, $71 a barrel. Gets my opinion, it gets my attention. Had been trading uh, below 70. Let's bring in a couple smart people who know about global energy. That would be Mike McGlone, senior macro strategist with Bloomberg Intelligence, and Fernando Valle, senior analyst with uh, Bloomberg Intelligence. Mike joins us from Miami via Zoom, and uh, Fernando's here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Mike, let's start with you. Uh, down in, in Miami, uh, dealing with the uh, the heat down there. Good for you. How is it um, now? No, oh, it's nice and humid, but I hear it's much warmer up north. It just gets <laughs> okay. <get> colder nights. <laughs> I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a hard time all summer here because I know you enjoy it in the wintertime. <laughs> hey, Mike, just give us a sense here. What's, you know, just from commodity trading perspective, what, what, do, you, what do you think about oil right here? It's a bear market. What stops it? To me, that's the bottom line. 
Um, the question is, has the market plateaued? And typically, there's no indications of that at all. Typically, what it takes for a broad commodity market to bottom, you need some form of significant lag to significant Federal Reserve easing. And a maybe, a, as Vince pointed out, maybe a weak dollar and a pretty significant pickup in China demand. They're all going the wrong way right now. The only thing that's going the right, and really cheap prices, the only thing that's going the right, right way, way is prices have gotten low. So let's look at, let's start with, we're talking about WTI. It's around 70 bucks a barrel, and it's almost half last year's price, but it's the same price as it first started to trade in 2005. The bottom line is natural gas, its cousin, has already collapsed. It got really cheap, and it's bounced. It got down to two. It's bounced up to near three it's in the middle there now and i think that's the trajectory for crude oil and the key thing i ask myself is what stops this as we tilt towards the second half as vince pointed out these long and variable legs the federal reserve is still tightening and I don't. And our chief economist Anna Wong says we're going to get a recession, likely in, in the second half. Yes, it's been delayed, and U.S. unemployment to start picking up around 4.3 percent. None of that, to me, is good for crude oil to sustain a bounce. It might have bounces, but none of that's good for it to sustain a new bull market. Fernando, I want to bring you in here. You're our senior analyst with Bloomberg Intelligence here, Fernando Valle. Um, Let's talk about so this uh, that Saud the Saudis and Russia are extending these oil supply cuts uh, to prop up the market. So, do you think it's going to work? This isn't the first time. Um, we've been, and like we said, prices are so low. Well, I think part of the balance today is that the, these cuts, the additional cuts, started in July, and today is really the first real trading day with volume because we had the holiday uh, yesterday in the U.S. Uh, but even then, you're not seeing a huge jump up in prices. You're seeing a, a relative strong, but nothing really to write home about. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the bull case that was predicated on the lack of spare capacity in global oil production. And when you cut production, what do you make? You create spare capacity. So we don't think that this is necessarily a bullish signal, as Mike was alluding to. Um, Demand is really the biggest driver that we're looking for. Uh, China demand is still not there. We're seeing some weaknesses in in the U.S. as well, and, and, and on the housing side, on the office real estate side, uh, those are the big concerns for the for the summer. Uh, and, and and when we looked at the inventory report from last week from the EIA, uh, we saw lower refinery utilization, lower refinery consumption of crude oil, and that's weird when you have. Crack spreads, the, the margin that refiners make at nearly two and a half times the average for the past 15 years. Uh, why aren't they running? And that suggests maybe the physical market is not as, as tight as we expected. Well, John Tucker, it, it, I mean, he moves the needle by himself just on a daily basis how much he drives back and 350 forth. 350 at the Wawa. This <laughs> 350 at the Wawa on Route 36 in Jersey, just to get your price check there. Um, Fernando, what are your companies telling you? What are the big majors telling you about what they're doing, where, where do they think energy's going, where are they investing these days? Well, there's a big bifurcation between the Europeans and the American major oil companies. When you look at the major oil companies, they're saying we're investing, oil is our business and we're going to continue to invest and we're going to invest in reducing the carbon emissions from existing production as opposed to investing in new ways of energy. And so far, it's it's proven to be the right call as far as a, re as a return standpoint. We've seen some of the Europeans like BP and Shell acquiesce uh, before they said they were, they were going to let their production fall by as much as 30%. And now they're saying, whoa, 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 the prices are too good, the returns are too good, and the returns on the renewable side are not nearly as good as we expected them to be. So we're going to invest uh, on our oil side again. Um, the question is, where do you invest now? Uh, Mike, I want to bring you back in here. You were talking to us before about these different factors right now that are keeping prices low, that we've got the China demand picture isn't so great. The Fed is obviously not easing. Um, which one of these are, you know, you think could, uh, among the other factors you mentioned too, what do you think could turn first uh, and really get uh, things moving in the other direction? That, that's the big problem, Molly. Typically, for the in this case, I think it's one of those most unique cases I've seen in my career in this business of almost four decades, and that is the Fed is unlikely to pivot or start easing until markets tell them to, i.e. stock market going down. And this is somewhat the view from our chief economist, because our, the measures they watch for inflation are very sticky. Personal consumption expenditure is still hovering just below 5%, and Fed funds are heading higher. So I don't see what it's 
it's going to take. And the, to me, the biggest risk for the second half is something I started really worried about um, starting pointing out a year ago. Is this is a, probably be one of the biggest economic resets of a lifetime. And we've had a bounce and we've had all the markets – um, equity markets think that we're not going to have a U.S. recession. Now, if we do tilt towards that in the second half, just the normal lag to the most aggressive federal rate hike easing or tightening ever, crude oil could just be a pawn in that space. Now, crude oil is down 10 percent on the year. It's not a big deal, but it's, it's brethren copper, the metal with the Ph.D. in economics, is it's, it's, you know, it's wiped out a pretty good rally in January. Now it's down in the year, too. And gold is the best performing commodity. So from a commodity standpoint, gold up crude oil and industrial metals down, that's a recessionary trajectory. And then I look over at the yield curve. Okay, that's tilting towards inversion, recessionary trajectory. And I look at the Fed, still tightening. There's nothing good in there except some kind of surprise I can't predict for the commodity bear market to end. All right. So, Mike, when people come up to me at cocktail parties and ask me for my commodities call because they never do, I just quote you and just say, <laughs> am I still long gold, short everything else? Um, well, I have. You know, I think gold is much likely to continue the rally to break out above this 2,000 level and never look back. It's a matter of time. And crude oils and most commodities are going to continue to do what they normally do. They get too expensive, and then pendulum swings to too cheap, and it has to get too cheap before they can bounce again. And we're nowhere near that too cheap phase, as, as Fernando says. There's still a lot of profits to be made. The average cost of production from U.S. producers is around $50 a barrel. So I just look at 40 as the key level should go back to. That was a key level in uh, 1990. I was in the trading pits then when the, um, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. It bounced mm -hmm. to 40. And guess the, get this, the bounce at the bottom, the ultimate bottom didn't come until 10, until right. um, about 10, until 1998. Now, things have really changed. The U.S. now is the biggest, one of, is a net, one of the biggest net energy producers on the planet and a net export. Yep. Hey, Fernando, real, real quick, 30 seconds. What do you think, which company do you think is the best position here of these big energy companies? Well, I think Exxon has done a, a terrific job in turning around this investment by uh, growing in Guyana, by acquiring the Permian. Uh, Chevron uh, equally has a sizable Permian position, and it's in good position. So I think the U.S. over Europe overall. Okay, great stuff. As always, we always get the nice, clean, concise call from both of you guys. Mike McGlone, senior micro, uh, macro strategist with the Bloomberg Intelligence uh, from the Miami office. Some folks refer to him now as Miami Mike. I don't know if that's going to stick. Fernando Valle, senior analyst with uh, Bloomberg Intelligence. He covers the global energy space, uh, covers all the big major uh, oil companies. So we like to speak to these two folks, get a good view uh, of global energy. Again, when you look at global energy, um, I was taught by some smart people in the energy space, it's a commodity and num num nuts. So you just have to know supply and demand, and that's where you go. So these two folks know that. All right, coming up, we're going to have more. This is Bloomberg. Let's get some company news right now with Steve Rappaport. Paul Moderna stock is up more than 2% after the drug maker signed a deal to make mRNA vaccines for China. Bloomberg's Gina Cervetti reports. Moderna signed a Memorandum of Understanding and Land Collaboration Agreement on Wednesday to work toward researching, developing, and producing mRNA vaccines in China, according to a statement. The developer of a vaccine for COVID-19 may invest around a billion dollars, according to a local media report. The Cambridge, Massachusetts-based drug maker said any medicines produced under the deal will be only for the Chinese market and won't be exported. Moderna adding the agreement targets unmet needs for Chinese patients. Patients. Gina Cervetti, Bloomberg Radio. Thanks, Gina. Better take a closer look at your luxury watch. The number of high-end fake watches is rising. That's according to pre-owned dealer Watchfinder. CEO Arjan van der Waal says as many as 10% of the timepieces they received from sellers last year were fake. What we're seeing in the last years is that the level of sophistication of these fake watches um, is uh, increasing uh, significantly. Van der Waal in an interview with Bloomberg Radio says Rolex replicas account for about half of the knockoffs on the market. And Amazon CEO Andy Jassy is taking a closer look at how much the company's Hollywood studio is spending on original TV programming. Last year, the company spent $7 billion on original shows, licensed programs, and sports, up from $5 billion the year before. Amazon is in the middle of a company-wide cost-cutting program, and that includes plans to eliminate at least 27,000 jobs. And those are the company stories we're following this hour. I'm Steve Rappaport, and this is Bloomberg.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom with this Bloomberg Business Flash. Uh, day at choppy trading, you have concerns about the faltering Chinese economy that dampened some of the risk appetite earlier. Uh, they've shrugged off some of the overnight weakness uh, stocks. Traders also waiting for the minutes, of course, of the FOMC, the June policy meeting. That was a confusing one with the pause and then the forecast for a couple more hikes. S&P 500 went into the 4th of July holiday at a 14-month high, having gained 16% for the year. And the S&P 500 right now, you have four of the 11 major industry groups. They are higher. Communication services leading the way with shares of Meta Platforms and Alphabet. They are both higher right now. S&P 500 overall, four points lower. That's down a tenth of a percent. 45.51 in the index. Dow Jones Industrial Average down 55 points. That is a decline of two-tenths of a percent. And the NASDAQ 100 giving up some of the earlier gains right now just to seven points higher. We check the markets for you all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Molly and Paul. All right, John Tucker, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Molly Smith and Paul Sweeney here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. I want to get right to our next guest, Jerry Smith, media reporter for Bloomberg News, one of the top media reporters out there breaking lots of news, and we got him here in studio. All right, so, Jerry, I want to start with ESPN. Back in my banking days, we pitched to spin that thing out. We thought we could get 40 times earnings, double the value. Back when Disney was trading at 20 times, we always got laughed out of the office, if not physically thrown out of the office by the CFO of Disney. What is ESPN going to do? What is Disney going to do with ESPN these days? What do you think going forward? I think that's one of the biggest questions in the media business right now is what the future of ESPN. Um, you know, it still makes a lot of money for Disney, and that's important to think about because Disney also has this whole streaming business with Disney Plus yep. where that loses a lot of money. So the money that ESPN and the cable network business makes is used to fund the streaming business. So you get rid of ESPN, then suddenly you have to ask, where are you going to fund your streaming business? Good point. Uh, but yeah, ESPN is, um, is dealing with the same thing that a lot of cable networks are dealing with, which is cord cutting. The number of subscriptions keeps going down and down, and they have a lot, they're have they spending billions of dollars on sports rights, and they have a lot of high-profile talent. And last Friday, we saw uh, about 20 of those uh, people who appear Jeff on camera. Jeff Van Gundy. Jeff Van Gundy, yeah. Jalen Rose, Susie Colbert were three of the yep. big names uh, who were laid off uh, as part of a cost-cutting initiative. And uh, part of that is, is really because ESPN is going to be under bigger scrutiny from Wall Street than ever before coming up. They are Disney, for the first time in one of the next few quarters, is going to break out ESPN's financial numbers for the first time. So that is clearly ESPN wants those numbers to look good. So they are going to, um, you know, they made some cuts to some of the, the high profile talent. At least they've kept the high profile tennis talent. I will <laughs> vouch for that. They are all very much in form at Wimbledon. So <laughs> happy good. from my perspective. But I'm wondering, Jerry, because isn't so much of the value of, you know, cable right now sports? Right? Isn't that so much of like where people have been saying this is why cable is still around and why streaming has not completely overtaken it, the whole picture? That's right. Yeah. I mean, if the people who subscribe to cable right now are in large part sports fans, some news fans as well, but live sports is really what's keeping the whole industry together. So one of the big questions with ESPN is when do they make that flagship channel available uh, as a streaming service, and the day that they do that could really, you know, unravel the whole business because you could see more people cut the cord uh, to sign up for this ESPN service, uh, and how much you price it is an open question. But um, yeah, I mean, live sports is really what's keeping it, the whole business together right now. And uh, you know, you, you say that live sports, absolutely, that's always been the case. But you think about the regional sports network business; the number one player out there is in bankruptcy. You know, a lot of teams aren't even having their games broadcast anymore. So that whole model is really under pressure. ESPN model under pressure. In that background, the rights keep going up. I mean, who's going to pay these 30, 40, 50 percent increase in rights if it's not ESPN? Right. I think we're really heading towards a cliff with this whole business where at some point some sports league is 
not going to be able to command the kind of increase in their rights fees that uh, that they have in the past. That hasn't happened yet. Uh, it's the amount that uh, live sports cost just keeps going yeah, up and crazy. up. But I think there's going to be a point where some of these sports leagues are going to take a haircut. Uh, I don't think it's going to be the really high-profile leagues. The big one coming up is the NBA, and I think everyone expects the NBA is still going to get uh, a nice premium from what they got. But people I talk to in the industry is say, look, watch for some of those middle tier sports that um, are really going to get squeezed right now. So if it's not, if ESPN, you know, you would think this is going to be like the channel here that can obviously weather whatever's going on in the sports industry. If they're not able to put it together, uh, you know, how are the networks faring? Obviously, ABC still part of the Disney empire, but when you look at NBC, CBS, some of the other ones that will, um, you know, broadcast live sports, how are they holding up? Well, those broadcast channels, uh, I mean, one interesting trend we've seen with cord cutting is a lot of people who not only cancel their cable for Netflix, but they also get these digital antennas. And you can actually get a lot of programming on that, including CBS, NBC, Fox. So those channels are, are, are weathering uh, the storm better. Um, and in fact, you know, the NBA, when they're looking for this next sports right deal, they really want to find a media partner that can offer them streaming and also a broadcast channel like an ABC or an NBC or a, or a CBS or Fox uh, because those channels have a lot more reach. We're seeing with these regional sports networks just a few weeks ago, the Utah Jazz did a deal where they um, their games are going to be available over an antenna, over a free over-the-air <laughs> channel, uh, and they did away with their cable uh, deal. They had a cable network that aired their games. That's not going to happen wow. anymore. So that's something that we're starting to see in the sports business is the cable channels, because of cord cutting, their reach is diminishing, and you're seeing a combination of more free over-the-air channels and streaming channels to kind of reach the widest audience possible. The real question there is at what point can those leagues still command the same kind of money they got from the cable channels? Uh, right now, they're not getting the same kind of money. So how do they make up that loss? Yeah, if I'm a, I think at some point this is going to trickle down to the athletes themselves. If I were somebody, I'd be locking up a long-term contract now. You know? Yeah, that's what's fascinating about the sports media business is everything's connected. Everything from how much the sports player is getting paid to the person at home who's canceling their cable service. There's a, a chain link, and everybody's yep. connected. And so more and more people cut the cord, and that trickles down all the way to the teams, how much they can play their uh, pay their players. Does that mean that people are even maybe, you know, if they're not paying to watch this stuff on cable anymore, does it even say, like, you, you, if you still really want to watch these games, you're going more in person? That's a good question. I think in, attendance in, in, in sports has actually been doing pretty well. I think Major League Baseball's attendance is doing well. They actually made an interesting change this year where they made the game shorter, which I think has yes. helped both the viewership and the attendance. Um but yeah, I mean that's that's something that years and years ago that were, there were these blackout rules yes. where you couldn't watch <laughs> sporting events because they wanted to make sure that enough people actually went to the games. Um, but yeah, I mean if you think about the business of owning a sports franchise, media rights are a huge piece of it, but also people going to the games, the attendance, ticket costs, yep. things like that. So yeah, that's an excellent question. I'm not sure what the answer is. Jerry, you cover the the whole media space soup the nuts here. Um, have we reached? peak Hollywood in the sense that, boy, the spending on TV shows and movies just exploded due to, all, due to Netflix and all the other streaming competitors. But now we're seeing companies like Disney saying, oh, we got to cut costs, including production costs. Uh, your colleague at Bloomberg News, Lucas Shaw, has got a, a story out about Amazon CEO wants to know why they're spending so much money on program. So if Amazon's asking that question, have we maybe had peak spending in Hollywood? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. And, and I'd encourage everyone to read Lucas's story because it's um, it's really one of the first times we've seen Amazon really look at the cost of their Hollywood studio. Uh, I think it helps to think of these streamers as different kinds of companies with different priorities. Um, you, know, you have Apple and Amazon who just have such enormously deep pockets that um, the losses that everyone's losing money on streaming, but the, they can sustain the losses uh, much easier than some of these other companies that where media is their whole business. Someone like a Disney uh, or Comcast uh, or Paramount, where they're having real cost cutting issues. Again, getting back to the whole um, cord cutting phenomenon. But yeah, we're starting to see even someone like Amazon. I mean, they're, they're spending $7 billion a year on streaming, uh, on programming, and then that's a drop in the bucket for, for them, but they're still looking at these losses. 
hey, you know, I was reading a research note by uh, Laura Martin at Needham and Company, and she was talking about Paramount. And her question, she was saying, hey, here are the questions I'm getting from institutional investors. And then when it came up to Paramount, the question was, when are they going to sell? Is that really a story? Is there a belief out there, Jerry, that maybe the, the you know, Sherry Redstone and the Redstone family and the trust would ever sell Paramount? I think that's something that people have been talking about for as long as I've been covering this beat. I mean, it's years and years. Um, I think that the you know this is an industry about scale, how big you can be, and I think Paramount, uh, even after they combined Viacom with CBS, has always been seen as being undersized, and everyone's always wondering, well, when is someone going to buy them? Um, but you know, there's also the companies that can afford to buy them are companies like an Apple or an Amazon. Everyone always wonders, but um, do those companies really want to get into the cable channel business with all the challenges that they're facing right now? Um, you know, maybe they could just sell off the studio. That might be attractive. But um, yeah, it's a scale business, and they've always been seen as undersized. So I think that's something everybody's always wondering. I think the Allen and Company Sun Valley conference is coming up. Where oh yeah! Everybody loves to talk about how there's deals being done there. That's so, this month, right? I believe that's coming up. Yeah. So that's. I didn't get my invite. I'm still waiting. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, New York Times. We talked about it. The New York Times still cranking it out. It's got a 6.5 billion dollar market cap. Everybody thought the New York Times was going out of business. A lot of other papers have, unfortunately. Uh, but the stock's up 22 percent year to date because content is king. So as long as you got the premium content. They'll figure out a way to get paid for it. And the New York Times, their app ha has been extraordinary. Their digital advertising has been great. So there's my little plug. I've been following New York Times company for like, you know, 40 years. Cooking and games. Those are the big ones. Exactly. Let's head down to Washington, D.C. right now. Hey, Jerry Smith, thanks so much for joining us from Bloomberg. Let's head down to Washington, D.C. Get World of National News with Nathan Hager. And some breaking news to start off, Paul. The Secret Service has now confirmed cocaine was found at the White House Sunday evening. A spokesman for the agency confirms that positive test now to ABC News. The White House was briefly evacuated over the weekend after the discovery of white powder in the West Wing. Preliminary tests indicated it was the illegal drug. Secret Service says it's still investigating how it got there. Sources tell the Washington Post report uh, that the uh, cocaine was found near an area where West Wing tourists are told to leave their cell phones. President Biden and his family were not at the White House at the time. They spent the 4th of July weekend at Camp David. White House says it is optimistic a deal can be reached between UPS and the Teamsters. That statement came hours after weeks of talks between the shipping giant and the labor union broke down. Greg Vallier with AGF Investments says a strike, if it happens, would pose a noticeable threat to the U.S. economy. I think it could shave uh, two-tenths, three-tenths off of GDP. Uh, it and then you add uh, onto that what's happening in Southern California at the height of their tourist season to have many hotels shut down. That might be another tenth or so. AGF's Greg Valier notes workers at Southern California hotels have been off the job since early Sunday in a labor dispute of their own. The U.S. Navy says it stopped Iran from seizing two oil tankers near the Strait of Hormuz this morning. A spokesman for the Navy's Fifth Fleet says Iranian forces fired shots at one of the vessels before the U.S. stepped in and they backed off. Climate activist Greta Thun Thunberg has reportedly been charged with disobeying police orders in her native Sweden. Local media say Thunberg and other young activists had to be removed by force after trying to block fuel trucks last month at the port of Malmo. Disobeying police orders carries a maximum penalty of six months in prison in Sweden. It's usually punished with fines. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. This is Bloomberg.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Zucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom with this Bloomberg Business Flash. All the major averages, they've just turned lower. The tech-heavy Nasdaq giving up some of the earlier gains. We saw the uh, mega caps, Meta Platforms, Alphabet, Microsoft. They are still holding on to their gains, though. Ben Gutteridge at Invesco says stocks can still build on their recent gains. Growth can remain relatively resilient as we move into the second half of the year and recessionary risks uh, would be more prominent for next year, which, um, you know, in amongst other factors, you know, allow, could, could well allow equities to continue enjoying uh, some decent momentum. The United Parcel Service workers, they're closer to maybe striking, and that could plunge the supply chain into disruption in the U.S. Uh, the Fed may offer some clues about its next moves later this afternoon. It's going to release the minutes from its latest meeting. S&P 500 right now. Three points lower. That's down about a tenth of a percent. 44.52 on the index right now. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, 49 points lower. That's down a tenth of a percent. The Nasdaq 100, back in the green right now, not by much, up uh, just about five points at 15,214. I was uh, during the break doing my New Jersey trivia. Yes. Question. Yes. Where because we did sharks earlier. Right. Um, the movie Jaws, sure. and the book by Peter Benchley, which inspired the movie, was inspired by what event? Yeah, the a shark, shark attack, attack in New in, Jersey. Of all places, Matawan, New Jersey, which is miles from the ocean. As I've just learned, yes, a good 15 <laughs> miles Even in. more shocking is that a certain person in the studio has never seen <laughs> the movie Jaws. Oh, you come know. on, John. We're not going to really <laughs> roast me on national uh, radio here, just, are we? You need to correct that as soon as possible. <laughs> I'm watching Wimbledon. I'm busy. <laughs> yes, she is. No, she's a, the but tennis no sharks steward. at Wimbledon. <laughs> yeah, there's no sharks at Wimbledon. Maybe. Only tennis sharks. <laughs> tennis sharks. John Tucker, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, we are our uh, definitely focusing on, on Wimbledon here because Molly Smith is a tennis aficionado, so we're keeping lots of discussion there. Let's check about the uh, fixed income business. Uh, 2022, a year to forget for pretty much everybody in the fixed income space. A little bit better this year. Uh, so we want to check in with Ward Bortz. He is Ward Bortz. He is the ETF portfolio manager, head of distribution, public strategies at Angel Oak. So, Ward, you know, I'm looking at the two-year treasury I don't know, 4.91%. I'll put some money in there, and I think I'll be quite happy. You know, What do you think about fixed income space these days? Yeah, we, to your point, I think 2022, it was painful getting there after years of really getting no yield, no return in the, in the fixed income markets. Uh, but 2023 has been off to a decent start in fixed income. You know, Our view at the beginning of the year was you could get equity-like returns in fixed income. Uh, and, you know, in our head, that's kind of call it eight to twelve percent, depending on what interest rates do throughout the year. We're about halfway there now, uh, right around four percent. I think high yield uh, so far this year is up five and a half percent. So you know, thus far it's been pretty good, and our expectation is through the rest of the year, it's it's not a bad place to be positioned, particularly given what you've seen on the uh, equity market so far this year. Yeah, Ward, you know, I used to cover credit and, you know, a lot of this, I'm I'm really just scratching my head here because rates have still gone up this year. We are hearing that rates are going to stay high this year. And yet you're seeing high yield, like you said, up close around five and a half percent, investment grade up three percent. Where is the where, where is this coming from? It's it's <laughs> the first time in, you know, I don't know how long. Uh, where carry actually matters. The coupon that you're getting from bonds, you know, are able to offset uh, the increases in yield. So, you know, to the, the point made earlier, if you can get 5% in uh, short-term treasuries, even if yields go up 100 basis points, it's going to be offset by the, the yield you're getting in, in bonds. And, and that's really what we're seeing with investors. We're seeing investors kind of doing the math on that and saying, you know what, I'm going to increase my allocation to bonds a bit uh, to really take advantage of what historically, or for at least for the last 10 years, has really been no opportunities. So how do you play this in the ETF space, Ward? Uh, so what we think is attractive, so maybe I'll answer that slightly differently. Where are the risks to this? So if we think about our outlook for the rest of the year, we think that the economy is going to start to slow down. 
So the, the impact of the Fed raising rates over the last year is going to start to be felt. Um, and you'll see an economic slowdown. Right now in traditional corporate credit, uh, uh, spreads are, are very tight. And so uh, we are encouraging investors to underweight corporate credit. Because if we do see a slowdown in the economy, that's going to feed into corporations, feed into earnings. Uh, potentially, you could see defaults start to increase, if not late this year, then early next year. Uh, and so we're saying underweight corporate credit, where you've already had decent returns for the year, as, as has been highlighted. And what we really like is mortgage-backed securities. So we call this uh -huh. securitized credit. So these are bonds. Uh, that you know are issued by Fannie and Freddie um, or uh, uh, those that aren't backed by the government, here you're able to get similar yields to what you get in the corporate space, if not higher. Uh, and we think a lot more upside because these are actually priced a lot wider than historical levels relative to, to corporate. So we really think that's the attractive place to, to play in the marketplace. So from an ETF standpoint, if you look at agency Mortgage-backed uh, ETFs like uh, uh, MVB uh, is a is a big one. Um, you know you're going to benefit both if rates start to decline and if the the yields and spreads of these mortgage-backed securities start to decline. In addition, we have a non-agency uh, ETF C A R Y, and this is kind of a, a little bit more bang for your buck, a little bit higher yield, but still investing in that mortgage-backed security opportunity that we see right now. And per that, uh, yeah, the, the, what you're talking about here with MBS, what's your view then on mortgages um, and how does that filter into this call? Uh, on the mortgage market generally, so that's going to be driven by a couple of things. So one is, you know, home prices. So what do we think is going to happen with home prices? And what you've seen so far this year is generally a stabilization in home prices after, you know, what everybody knows was an incredible 2000. Uh, 2021 20, and even 22 in terms of home price appreciation, we think you'll start to see a stabilization in, in home prices, but not really a significant depreciation. So we think from a credit standpoint, those mortgage bonds, those mortgage-backed securities are actually in really great shape because the, the houses that back them uh, are doing great from a, a price standpoint. Ward, what do you think about... Uh, private credit. It's a it's a business. It's a market. It's an asset class that has really has come onto the scene in the last, I don't know, decade or so, and it's gotten so popular. How do you guys think about that? Do you have exposure there? What do you think about that? So we do not. So number one, it has been an explosion. Uh, you know, we kind of thought, given the increase in yields that you've seen in traditional public markets over the last year, that there would be a decline in growth in uh, in private credit, but but the, it hasn't worked out that way. People continue to demand private credit significantly, and this is really, uh, um, you know, backed by corporations, similar to corporate bonds, except, you know, private loans. Uh, we think that, you know, from everything we've seen, there'll be continued growth there. Uh, our concern is, whenever you see an asset class explode in growth, as you've seen in private credit, uh, you can see lending standards start to decline. And the, the private credit asset class really has not been tested yet. And so our concern about it is when you start to see that economic slowdown, you've seen significant growth in the size of the asset class. Have the underwriting standards held up as much as, you know, as much as they were historically, where you've had very low default rates and, and high recovery rates in private credit. So, you know, in our head, the, the jury's still out on whether or not private credit's able to withstand the, the, the first downturn that it sees. All right, Ward, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it, uh, getting some of your time here. Ward Bortz, he's the ETF Portfolio Manager, Head of Distribution Public Strategies at Angel Oak. Before that, uh, he was a Dimensional Fund Advisors, trader, trading at RBC Capital Markets, all kinds of uh, stuff there at BlackRock as well. So uh, lots of experience uh, out there in the space uh, getting his thoughts on fixed income. Much better year in 2023 uh, and a high yield, you know, uh, return of over 5% or about 5% this year so far. It's pretty darn impressive. I was just looking even triple C is up about 10% this year. Yep. So not seeing the stress yet. Yeah. Definitely uh, not. Exactly. And it, but that's after a brutal 2022. So a lot of room, uh, a, a lot of still digging needs to be done to get out of that hole. So uh, 
Uh, we'll keep up on that. S&P unched on the day. This is Bloomberg. Let's get some company news right now with Steve Rappaport. All Rivian stock is up more than 1% as the company starts delivering electric vans made for Amazon to Europe. More on that from Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines. You can expect to see more than 300 of the electric vans that Rivian makes for Amazon on the German roads in the weeks ahead. This is Rivian's first international commercial shipments outside of the U.S. Now, for context, Amazon, of course, is Rivian's largest shareholder, its biggest customer, and it's ordered 100,000 of these vans to be delivered by the end of the decade. Thanks, Kaylee Kripal. Rivian stock is on track for a sixth consecutive day of gains. That would be its longest winning streak since September. It's a good time to shop for a new car. Bloomberg's Lisa Mateo reports. The car industry is expected to see as much as a 14% jump in new car sales for the first half of the year. According to the Wall Street Journal, Kia, Nissan, Honda, Tesla, and Rivian, they're all reporting strong first half numbers. Experts say it's due to pent up demand from shoppers who've been waiting out supply shortages and higher prices. Thanks, Lisa. As for the second quarter, Toyota reported sales climbed 7.1% and more than double that rate in June. Monster Beverage has agreed to acquire rival Bang Energy out of bankruptcy for $362 million. Bang filed for Chapter 11 protection last October after Monster sued the company for false advertising and other alleged misconduct. A California jury awarded Monster Ener Energy $293 million in damages, but the deal is still subject to bankruptcy court approval, and a spokesperson says there's no guarantee that will happen. Those are the company stories we're following this hour. I'm Steve Rappaport, and this is Bloomberg.
You're listening to Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. All right, Paul Sweeney here along with Molly Smith, our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studios, looking at these markets here pretty much unchanged on the day. Not a lot, a little bit of red on the screen here. S&P off one-tenth of one percent, the Dow off two-tenths of one percent, NASDAQ off one-tenth of one percent as well. So not much movement on the indexes right here. Looking at the uh, the dollar, the Bloomberg dollar index, uh, it is higher again today, 120, one, two, three, three, spot seven, seven. So continued strength in the U.S. dollar here, expectations uh, of uh, rising interest rates uh, certainly impacting uh, the greenback right here. Right now, let's head down to Washington, D.C. we got World International News with Nathan Hager. Okay, Paul, thanks. There's been a second test on that white powder found at the White House over the weekend, and the Secret Service is now confirming that that substance was cocaine. The investigation now uh, continues into how it got there. The Washington Post is citing three people familiar with the ongoing investigation and saying the cocaine was found near an area where West Wing tourists are told to leave their cell phones White House staffers are authorized to give tours to West Wing guests, typically on nights and weekends, though the Secret Service is not confirming whether any of those tours happened this past weekend. In any case, President Biden wasn't at the White House at the time. He spent the long Fourth of July weekend at Camp David. The White House says it is hopeful UPS and the Teamsters can reach a mutually beneficial agreement. That is after weeks of labor talks between both sides fell apart Early this morning, a White House spokeswoman says the Biden administration is in contact with both sides. The breakdown puts more than 300,000 UPS workers a step closer to a strike that could hit the U.S. supply chain unless a deal is reached by the end of this month. The Biden administration's efforts to counter misinformation online just took a legal hit. A federal judge in Louisiana has ruled that Agencies can no longer pressure social media platforms to remove speakers or viewpoints that they disagree with. NYU law professor Bert Newborn says this ruling may be a constitutional violation of its own. The government has a constitutional right to try to persuade you to behave in a particular way. And as far as I know, uh, the contacts with the social media platforms um, that are being dealt with in this injunction uh, are jawboning. Uh, they're simply the government calling up and saying, hey, this is a serious issue. You guys should handle it. NYU Laws burn newborn in the ruling. U.S. District Judge Terry Dowdy said the case arguably involved the most massive attack against free speech in U.S. history. Less than a week after the Supreme Court rolled back affirmative action in college admissions, legacy admissions are coming under new pressure in the Ivy Leagues. A bill has been introduced in Massachusetts that would tax Colleges like Harvard, Williams, and, and a half dozen other schools that favor the children of alumni and donors and meet certain endowment thresholds and give that money to poorer community colleges. Bill sponsors say Harvard alone would get a $103 million fee per year under this legislation. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Nathan Hager in Washington, and this is Bloomberg, Paul and Molly. All right, Nathan Hager, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Molly Smith, Paul Sweeney here in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Molly, I think one of the best sporting events to attend in New York City, one of the best experiences in New York City is the U.S. Open tennis. That's my line. That's I've been pitching this for a long time. <laughs> um, my daughter lives in the city, and I've got her going to it, and it's really popular with her friends, too. Um, when do you go? What days do you go? What days do you recommend people if they really want to go and get a great experience? Day one of week one, okay, hundred um, percent. I think. Look, it does take a little bit of navigating. Yep. Grounds are huge. A lot of courts to keep your eyes on. But this is where you know what I like to tell people is like, you have no idea how good these people have to be just to suck at the U.S. Open. Right. <laughs> like that, if you are in the main draw of a Grand Slam, you are in the top one hundred twenty-eight players yep. in the world. That's not nothing. Yep. Sure, you could get destroyed. But you're still pretty amazing. And to see them up close, you can't beat that. Yep. Uh, I usually, go, I've been told, go to the first Tuesday, which is what I'm doing again this year. And again, seeing the matches in this, in this stadiums are great, but also going out to the outer courts and watching these people practice, as Molly su suggested, you're like, boy, when you get it up close and personal, wow, they're good. Yeah. And again, I recommend it just as a great New York City experience, the U.S. Open on Queens. This is Wimbledon.
This is Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney. We got a lot of green on the screen here, but the volume is light. This is a market that's much more optimistic or bullish than maybe the central bankers are. 9.5 million job openings. What are people doing? Are they just sitting in Starbucks all day? Breaking market news and insight from Bloomberg experts. There's still some concern out there in the market that there is room for things to deteriorate a little bit more than what they're indicating. As small and medium-sized businesses struggle, they don't present as much competition. What are you guys thinking about hardware, software? How should investors approach this thing called AI. This is Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. All right, coming up on this hour, we're going to check in with Quincy Crosby, Chief Global Strategist at LPL Financial, uh, discuss markets and get her perspective on inflation and the outlook for a recession. Is it in the cards? Take a look at the stock market. Adam Gold, the founder and CIO of Catam Hill, LLC. He's going to join us to dis, uh, discuss his investing call here for the second half of the year. Maybe a little discussion on that work from home, which I'm not really familiar with since I'm in the office every day. Rebecca Ray, Executive VP of Human Capital at the conference board, will discuss their recent findings. So we'll get a little updated look at the work from home thing. But right now, let's go to Charlie Pellet for a Bloomberg Business Flash. Hi, thank you very much, Paul Sweeney. A lot of red on the screen right now with the Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ all trading lower. Traders awaiting the latest FOMC minutes coming up just under two hours from now. With the S&P now lower by nine, down two tenths of one percent, 44.46 right now on the S&P 500 index. We've got the Dow down by 100 points. That is a drop of three tenths of one percent. NASDAQ down 40, a decline right now of three-tenths of 1%. Ten-year yield, 3.90% with a two-year, 4.92%. We've got uh, Bitcoin right now down 1.5%, 30,339 on Bitcoin. Gold is down one-tenth of 1%, 1923 the ounce. And West Texas intermediate crude up 3.2%, 72.01 a barrel right now on WTI. Bottom line here, ahead of the Fed minutes, we're looking at a losing day for the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ. As for the overall market backdrop, Nimrit Kang is co-chief investment officer at North Star Asset Management, and she was interviewed right here on Bloomberg Markets. You know, a lot of um, people are calling this a poly crisis age. There are a number of things that are coming together. But generally, all that means is higher level of uncertainty and volatility in the markets. That to us just says that, you know, we just need to be very risk aware and focused on running very diversified portfolios for our clients. And you can hear more of that conversation on the Bloomberg Tapes podcast. You can download it wherever you get your podcasts. Well, as we heard from Nathan, more than 300,000 United Postal Service workers are closer to striking after the company failed to reach an agreement with the International Brotherhood of uh, Teamsters. UPS shares, they are down 1.5%. Rival FedEx up now by 5 tenths of 1%. Again, recap Stocks are trading lower with the S&P down 8, down 2 tenths of 1%. Ten-year yield 3.91%. And the two-year ahead of the Fed minutes 4.92%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie Pella, thank you so much. We appreciate that, as always. Molly Smith and Paul Sweeney here in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. As Charlie was just mentioning, a little bit of red on the screen here. Let's see where the action is under the hood. We can welcome Bloomberg Cross Asset reporter Emily Grafeo. Emily, thanks for coming into the studio here. What are you looking at? So I'm looking at Meta right now, nice. one of the best performers. Facebook. I'm old school Facebook. Go ahead. <laughs> Facebook. That's right. And it's right. also an alphabet-free studio as well, so we right. go Google here. Google. Okay. Google. <laughs> and it's hundreds of share classes. <laughs> yes. But yeah, Meta <laughs> is the third best performing stock in the S&P 500, up just about 3 per cent right now. And this comes as they're launching their Twitter competitor app, Threads. It's coming out tomorrow, but actually users of Instagram, which is a meta company, can start to download and get access to the app. Now, are soon. you guys going to be, knowing what you know about Threads, are you going to be Thread people? I'm still working on building up my Twitter presence. Okay. <laughs> so it's going to be a hard switch to now have to make an entirely new um, okay. social media account. So I'm not planning on it but oh I don't does know, your Molly. editor does your editor know you're not planning <laughs> if, if my editor asks me to make this account i will do it okay. i will do whatever they want <laughs> i gotta say i'm um yeah i really 
I'm sure our listeners are aware now. I really only tweet about tennis. I don't have a whole lot else to say. Um, so I'm probably. Well, now I'm going to follow you. I don't know if I'm at Molly Smith News, if you're okay. curious. But yeah, um, I don't think, I don't see myself being an adopter. It would be interesting, though, to see the, how it stacks up with the competition. Because at least when it comes to reels, Meta was pretty successful in becoming a competitor to TikTok with their Instagram reels I product. Can follow you. So maybe this is um, a real tailwind for Meta to launch. Um, another competitor act. That's certainly what they're trying to do here. You know, I followed uh, Facebook since the day it went public mm-hmm. um, very closely, and it's always been about a top line growth story. Just grow the top line, grow the mm-hmm. top line, whether it's grow subscribers, grow revenue. Now the stock's up 144% on an entirely different story, which is cutting expenses. Mm-hmm. Amazing how that worked. Yep, beat out the competition. You're right, up year to date over 140%. I guess that also just reflects though the broader tech rally, people piling into tech as a defensive safety play. We saw that during the pandemic, and we're seeing that again now, those big tech stocks up. Netflix, not as much today. It was a little bit higher in the pre-market now, basically flat, but they got an upgrade from Goldman Sachs that their password sharing crackdown <laughs> is working out and disclaimer I have a very personal connection to this because this weekend I tried to log into my family Netflix and you got booted and I got booted so what happens oh. when, when you try to do that it's when devastating it tells <laughs> I felt you it, too. it says this account <laughs> is not associated with this household uh. and then it gives you two options to say that you're traveling or this other button, which I'm not entirely sure how it works because I didn't click on it, but you have to put in your phone number and my brother is actually the one that pays for it and we're not in the same household. So. Ah, so, so now the big question, will you sign up for it? I'm not sure. I'm not a big TV watcher and there's okay. so many streaming services yeah. out there. I don't right. think I'm the only one that feels this way that now it's time to get more selective. Totally. If you can't have like five different But don't you have services. to pay for these other ones? Are they still, are you still sharing, I'm air quote, sharing? <laughs> Am I allowed to say this on there? <laughs> I may be still okay. sharing some That's of what I these say. I, like I, I have a sense, I can't prove it, but I have a sense that several of my offspring are, you know, yes. on my account. So, they're mooching. Uh, yes, they're mooching. Selectively. Selectively, okay. yeah. And but this o- is only one is allowed, uh, and the other three I've tried to cut off completely. We'll see if it works. I mean, they've been successful so far. And Goldman actually had a street low on their price target for Netflix at $230, and now they set the price target to $400, wow. which is actually below where Netflix is trading. So now they have a neutral rating. Um, but the stock has 28 buys, 25 holds, and three sells among the analysts tracked by Bloomberg. Yep. I'll tell you that. I don't know, the, the folks that weren't buying off on that cost-cutting story, mm. they missed it. Uh, yeah, completely. Uh, and just quickly, where is uh, that price target range, roughly? Where does that 420 fit in? It's <laughs> it's one of the higher points. Interesting. But yeah, that yep. 230 was a street low, so right. big upgrade there. All right, anything else you're looking at out there in the markets? Just getting ready for the minutes. I've been talking to some strategists. We expect... The same hawkish Fed speak that we've seen over the last few weeks, that's likely to be reflected in the minutes. This Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, wanting to walk back the market expectation of rate cuts. And they've actually done a pretty good job. If you look at where the bond market is pricing in um, on the WIRP page in Bloomberg, we don't have any more rate cuts. See, the WIRP page... It's lost all credibility with me. I mean, sorry for Tom on the on the sixth floor who worked to put that together. But, I mean, it just it was telling you rate cut, rate cut, rate cut. Right. Even though the Fed and anybody else you talked to was right. saying, no, we're raising rates, we're raising rates. And, right. and the, the market wasn't there. Um, but the Fed seems like the Fed was right. There was also a lot of CFTC positioning data that was showing there was a big story on the Bloomberg terminal a few weeks ago that there were still a lot of hedge funds betting on higher rates. And then you go to these outlook events from BlackRock, um, Franklin Templeton, I'm speaking of sources there, and they all expected the higher rates too. Right. So we all had this mystery of like, what is WARP yep. tracking? Because a lot of people are talking about expecting higher rates. Yeah, it looks in, you know, Fed fund futures, that's kind of where it goes. And right now it's got an 85% uh, likelihood of a rate hike at right. the uh, uh, July 26th meeting. I'm watching that two-year as well. We're at 4.93 right now. Yep. We're pretty close to 5%, and that would be the March high if we uh, break through that. Okay, 
Great stuff. Emily Grafeo, thank you so much for joining us thank here you. in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Uh, I want to get right to our next guest, Quincy Crosby. Uh, we like chatting with her. Chief Global Strategist for LPL Financial. Uh, that trades under on the NASDAQ under the ticker LPLA. Um, Quincy, I'd just love to step back and let's start off with just getting kind of, you know, your general top of the market call right here. Where are you guys? How are you positioned? What are you telling your clients? Well, right now, you know, we're a little bit more conservative. Um, we expect to see the market hit some volatility and readjust. I mean, even now, watching after the uh, the, the big close for the uh, quarter, uh, the market repositions because some of those coming into the market were, were kind of forced. You know, there's some of the portfolio managers without the big mega tech conviction in order to, to maintain performance and clients, they were they were forced to come in along with short covering, along with the rest of the fear of missing out. But after that, and that's now and next week, there will be some repositioning and we're keeping our eye on that. But overall, it is more of the Fed and it is how many more rate hikes do the, does the market expect? Certainly you're right. I mean, 80 something percent. Uh, I doubt that the Fed minutes is going to change that at all. If anything, it may push it up higher for the 26th of July. But the question is, do they get the one after that? And are they then finished? Because the market will be pleased if it's finished, but not if the Fed still hasn't gotten rid of core inflation. And that's going to be difficult for the market. Yeah, of course, we've got a you know CPI reading coming up pretty soon. That'll give us a better look at that. What are some other catalysts, Quincy, that you're looking for right now, whether it's economic data, uh, company, company, company news, uh, commodities, what, what be it that may be uh, some important market drivers in the coming weeks? It's going to be the earnings because every earnings season so far, we've been paying attention to whether or not they beat the estimates. And, and you know, it hasn't been stellar, but it's been... It has been okay. Uh, the economic underpinning has also not been stellar, but it hasn't been dire. You know, 2% GDP is, 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 is all right. And, and a huge upward see, revision on that. that. That A lot stronger yeah. than we thought it was. Exactly, exactly. And what we're looking for in the earnings season is operating margins. Because if we are going to really hit the labor market. It is going to come from pressure in operating margins because what happens then is companies need to let go of their input costs, which primarily for most companies happens to be labor. And then you get the labor market hurting and then you get consumer spending hurting. It's a trajectory of how you move into a recession. So far, it's been holding up. The question is, will what will we see in the uh, guidance coming up uh, in just a few days, actually? Hey, Quincy, one of the many reasons uh, we like speaking with you is you have a, a global perspective here. I'd love to get your, your thoughts on maybe kind of where are the relative opportunities on, on a global basis? Are you thinking any differently today than maybe you were several years ago? Well, yeah, there's one definitely, and that's Japan. It's doing very, very well. And it, Japan has had a difficult time emerging from actually from World War II with the banking system that was in, integral to keeping full employment, the zombie companies alive. Finally, they were able to unwind that. It took them a long time. But shareholder value has been difficult for them to to offer. And it looks as if they're turning the corner. You know, we have to trust but verify. But it looks as though this has become important. They want global investors, not as any traders, but global investors. The Bank of Japan, you know, is still in the camp that they want to make sure that inflation finally is intact. They want some inflation, not the deflation that set in for so many decades. Also, ultimately, they are going to ease on yield curve control, that's obviously going to push the yen a bit higher. But overall, it is about delivering shareholder value. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better advertisement than Warren Buffett going there <laughs> and now seeking. You, you, you can't pay for that. Uh, but more and more managers are, are thinking, you know what, maybe this is really a viable turn. And they're, go and they're moving in. And we're looking at developed markets, but Japan, the third largest economy in the world, 
is delivering. The charts are incredible and there's more to go. And so we have been looking at that. In terms of Europe, obviously they have pressures and part of that is related to China. Uh, it's been disappointing. The uh, Chinese authorities seem to be hesitant to take on more debt with fiscal stimulus. Uh, but given their problems, especially youth unemployment, they don't, as we all know, they will not tolerate any demonstrations whatsoever. But if they don't resolve that, there are going to be demonstrations. And that is something that is uh, obviously verboten in, in China. So we expect to see something there. The point I'm making is that is going to help their partners in the Eurozone, particularly Germany, France, and Italy. So how are you playing that then? As we're seeing all of this weakness come out of China, this was also supposed to be such a great yeah. year for China, which has really just stumped a lot of people, you know, COVID zero being relaxed, and that has really right. done not done a whole lot to stimulate the economy there. So how is that feeding into your investment call right now? Well, you know, it's been muted to say the least, but you know, again, uh, they just need a little bit to get some of those uh, industrial production numbers in Germany higher and the exports higher. Some good news, we watch the export numbers out of South Korea. That's a bellwether for exports. And they're still the export is still down, but it's up from the bottom. And sometimes what we pay attention to is less bad news. And certainly out of uh, South Korea, it's been less bad news. And what we're hoping is that that is going to spread to uh, the Eurozone as well. Interestingly enough, uh, the uh, luxury goods sector had done very, very well, thanks to the consumers in China coming out of COVID and spending. They actually thanked the Chinese consumers and made a point of saying the American consumers are not as active in the luxury goods sector. But we've seen that uh, consumer spending is down again in China. So we're watching that because that's a very important uh, sector, uh, basically French and Italian, that uh, has done extremely well. But we're looking at the overall picture. And we are hoping that it picks up and that the exports out of South Korea is a harbinger for a, a stronger uh, Eurozone. Boy, we can go anywhere. I mean, anywhere with Quincy. How about this one? She's a former, <laughs> former U.S. diplomat posting as energy attache at the U.S. Embassy in London. So I got to go. What, what do you think about the global energy markets here, Quincy? Well, you know, this is something I followed in the private sector as well, but also uh, in my portfolio in Europe, uh, and included OPEC. I have to put that in there. But uh, <laughs> it's it's difficult because it is a spot market. Russia has not held back, although supposedly now they're cutting for the only reason that it, they're hoping it pushes prices higher. Why? It's to help fund the um, their military um, yep. positioning vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. So that's obvious. But you can see where the macroeconomic is putting pressure on the Saudi cuts, uh, the, the ultimate right. put in the market is Saudi because they know what they need for their yep. budget. It All is right. very high. Quincy, Even just absolutely fabulous. We could go on and on and on with you about every market. We'll get you back soon. Quincy Crosby, Chief Global Strategist, LPL uh, Financial. And again, uh, check out Quincy's, you know, just go on and Google her, her resume. She has done everything on a global scale. We appreciate getting a few minutes. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's get some company news right now. Steve Rappaport. All Tesla deliveries in China are surging as concerns about supply chain issues, the impact of COVID-19, and weaker consumer demand begin to fade. Tesla's Shanghai plant delivered more than 93,000 vehicles in June, nearly 20% higher from the same time last year. Late-night negotiations between UPS and the Teamsters Union failed to produce a breakthrough on a new labor agreement. Bloomberg's Jeff Bellinger reports. Steve, the two sides worked late into the night before the Teamsters say discussions collapsed around 4 o'clock this morning. The Teamsters tweeted that UPS walked away from the table after presenting what the union called an unacceptable offer that did not address members' needs. UPS says it is proud of the offer it made and it did not walk away. It is urging the Teamsters to resume talks. The current labor agreement covering about 330,000 UPS workers expires July 31st. A Teamsters 
Employer spokesperson says union employees will not work beyond that date without a contract. Steve? Thanks, Jeff. UPS delivers 20 million packages a day. FedEx and the U.S. Postal Service may not have the capacity to carry the extra workload. Shares of UPS down, down more than 1.5%. American Equity Investment accepts a $4.3 billion cash and stock takeover from a division of Canadian investment giant Brookfield. Brookfield Reinsurance will buy shares for $55 apiece. That offer represents a 35% premium to American Equity's closing price on June 23rd. That was the last full trading day before Bloomberg revealed the interest in the deal. And those are the company stories we're following this hour. I'm Steve Rappaport, and this is Bloomberg. Headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business app. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. It's 1221 on Wall Street. We do check markets all day long here at Bloomberg. We've got one hour, 39 minutes to go until the latest FOMC minutes. And stocks are now lower across the board. The Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ, all in the red. Throw in as well the NASDAQ 100 index and the Russell 2000. That index, by the way, down now by about nine-tenths of one percent. Stocks are slipping ahead of those minutes as traders prepare to dissect the commentary to try to gauge what action the central bank will be taking taking later this month. S&P now lower by nine, down two tenths of one percent. We do have the Dow lower now by 124 points. Dow Jones Industrial Average today down by about four tenths of one percent. We have got uh, shares, uh, actually the uh, NASDAQ Composite Index down 25, dropped there of two tenths of one percent. And uh, right now we have got the NASDAQ 100 Index, a little change down by less than one tenth of one percent. Ten-year yield, 3.91%. We have got the two-year yielding, 4.92%. Spot gold down $2 the ounce to 1923. And the West Texas Intermediate Crude up 3.1% right now. WTI 71.96 a barrel. A down base for shares of Coinbase Global at Piper Sandler. Analyst Patrick Moley says the uncertainty swirling around Coinbase Global has made it too difficult to forecast how much revenue the company could earn. Right now, Coinbase lower by 2.4%. Again, recapping, we do have stocks trading lower with the S&P down 9 now, down two-tenths of 1%. Two-year yield, 4.92%, with the 10-year, 3.91%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie Pella, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Uh, Molly Smith, Paul Sweeney here in a Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. FOMC meeting minutes, I guess it used to be a thing back in the day, but it just seems like... We hear from these Fed members, you know, publicly speaking all the time. 
I like to joke that they're on tour more than rock stars are. <laughs> exactly. They are constantly speaking. Very it's uh, it's a lot to keep up with. So I'm just, you know, I don't know what we're going to get out of these things, but we have s smart economics people here that do read these minutes and will tell us if something important uh, is right. happened. So uh, let's talk to somebody who puts money to work for a living, Adam Gold. He's the founder and CIO of Katam Hill LLC. Adam, thanks so much for joining us here on the Zoom thing. Um, what are you telling your clients these days about the market? The first half of the year, boy, that was a nice rebound from, from last year. Where do we go from here? Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me back on. Uh, it's good to see you this time. Um, we, uh, you know, last year we, we spoke uh, uh, in the spring, right after the war had started, and that was a game changer. I call that a black swan event, a complete outside of company fundamental uh, shock. And we had one a couple of years before that. We had the COVID lockdowns in 2020. And it took a very long time for the economy, just on the job front, to get back to the pre-pandemic employment number. If you think about 20 million jobs lost um, between March and April, uh, we only got back to that uh, growth in, 20, in June of 2022. So this rebound, really since the 2020 recession, uh, though there's always a forecast of a new recession coming, we haven't seen that yet. And that was the fear last year, that the, the spike in oil prices and inflation was going to cause a very hard landing, and that hard landing continued to get pushed out. So that didn't happen last year, but there was some growth reset. And so we told clients last year that, and we told you on that when we spoke, we're going to continue to buy on the tough days. We're going to buy the great companies. We think that we call them the true compounders, the generational companies that we can pass on to our children. And hopefully we never have to sell them because they'll continue to innovate. And that did not work well last year, but we <laughs> did not give up. We told clients that we're going to continue focusing on innovation profitable innovation, real innovation, real economics, real unit uh, profitability. And so far this year, we've been uh, rewarded. Clients have been rewarded who've stuck with us. Uh, and so that that's very gratifying. You know, Adam, I would hate to say that the Fed minutes are um, a whole lot of nothing because apparently that's bad for ratings, I've been <laughs> told. Um, but is there any kind of, you know, surprise you could see coming out of this um, or even from like a market reaction perspective? We're not as focused on you know, those sort of minute by minute uh, ticks. I think we think about rates on a on a general um, you know, interest rates and inflation levels. And so uh, a few more hikes, no hikes, that doesn't change the story. I think if inflation uh, picks up once we lap some of these really hard comparisons, we were very optimistic late last year after the inflation number of June was 9%. We were kind of fearful, sweating in the night. It was going to be double digits, which happened in Europe. We thought that would mean rates were going to have to go to high single digits. And then... Once we, we went from 9% and now we're at 4%, we'll face a really easy comp in June. And you know, I think a concern would be if that inflation rate picks back up um, and then do rates have to you know, start to move up again, as opposed to the concern was always recession and then cuts. But a fl you know, being here almost at the end, as Paolo said, you know, we're going to slow down as we try to uh, get the boat into the dock here. That's positive. As long as the, the slope of change has, um, has decelerated, then that's very positive. So yeah, we, we're not very concerned on a minute by minute or on the minutes basis, but um, you know the data, the facts in the future that will determine our outlook. Adam, you know you talk about innovation and, and some of the thematic investing you guys do. One of the buzzwords so far, or buzz initials, um, or acronym in 2023 has been AI. What does AI mean to you guys, and do you feel like it's something you need to to own or get exposure to? Oh yes, we we've been very excited by this. We um, we've took a position in Nvidia back in 2016, so we've held that um, uh, for accounts and been buying that very aggressively, especially last year, um, a few years ago during the crypto bubble. This company is uh, incredible; it's done very well this year. Um, but the the real focus is the amount of innovation that VCs uh, founders are pouring in, and you sort of on a daily basis hear about some very large funding rounds. Now, we're not sure about those companies that actually that are getting these funding rounds because many of them don't have products yet. But the company that is benefiting, there's several in our portfolio who have been positioned this for a long time, um, are the picks and shovels, are the hardware, um, the cloud providers. And so NVIDIA is a company that's very unique. They have hardware, they have software, they have services, something that Apple has, something that Tesla has. Very rare few companies have this ability to innovate internally and to vertically integrate, which cuts out a lot of costs and increases margin. Um, and so, yeah, AI as a theme is excellent. AI, the company, doesn't really have much revenue or product <laughs> growth. So we won't talk about that one, but uh, it's very hard to short that, actually. So it kind of tells you where some of the borrow rates are. Um, but the theme of AI is, is monumental. 
And what it means for us is what it means for our companies, for portfolio companies, for public companies. And, and that's very exciting. And that's sort of to be determined right now. There's a lot of excitement around the chat. Uh, GPT came out. That was something that in Q4, we got a lot of uh, interest, a lot of blogs, a lot of VCs, technical people talking about the excitement there, that sort of consumer moment to 100 million users. But now businesses actually have to realize what is that going to mean for our for our customers, for our service. And so there's front end experiences, chat, voice, uh, visual, and then there's back end services. And so the technology sector is very diverse. There are a lot of ways um, you can play themes. There's a lot of companies that win. There's many companies that often lose sometimes. In the AI is sort of excitement here. It seems like there's a lot of winners um, that will come, but we don't actually know what those are quite yet. So we've, again, back in reality, innovation. Uh, NVIDIA has been one that has um, absolutely uh, accelerated their business. They pulled forward a lot of estimates. Uh, and what's incredible is the shares had a great um, reaction the last time they had earnings because their guidance was $4 billion above what 58 sell-side analysts had expected. <laughs> and the shares were up 20 plus percent, but the PE multiple shrunk the next day because the Q2 earnings estimate went from a dollar to $2 just in one quarter. And so it sort of shows the incredibleness uh, you know, of what innovation can mean and how hard it is to try to analyze these on a on a minute by minute or quarterly basis. And so we're, we're much longer term. Uh, we've been very excited by AI for many years. We're very happy to see it gets a lot of interest uh, you know, on media every day. But um, the reality is that this was a great company. It's been investing uh, aggressively for a decade plus. Uh, and we emailed the CEO that day. We told him how proud we were. Uh, he was in Taiwan. He replied the next day, actually, it's 8 a.m. on Friday. We emailed him Thursday evening and I got back. Uh, Thank you for the kind words, Adam. Mm. You know, we're, we're proud to have you as a shareholder. And that's the kind of relationships we like to build. That's kind of what we focus on for our clients. I mean, I'd be proud, too, if my stock was up about 200% year to date. It looks pretty good. Um, you were saying, though, there are there could be some losers from this. Um, any obvious ones that stand out to you? Um, of course, you know, us journalists fear for our jobs, other people, if AI has really come in, the robots. And talk us through where some of those risks are. Of course, I ask Chat GPT every day what's going to happen to Apple stock uh, at the end of the year. They I like know? To always Does it know? They don't. Unfortunately, they say we, right. we are not able to answer that question. Now, they might actually have the answer, but because of guardrail, they're not able to tell us. I did ask them what I should talk about on the show today. They also said they're not able to make investment recommendations or offer any advice. And so uh, I think the fear around job loss is something that's happened uh, historically for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And what happens is people get more productive, people innovate, new jobs get created. So prompt engineering, you can learn there's a whole new craft that just emerged in the last few months, a whole new area of data science. Um, and so I think people will get more productive. I think that's actually very beneficial for the economy as a whole. Um, if you're a coder and now software can help uh, co-pilot is a phrase people, a lot of companies use. If that can help co-pilot your work, increase your productivity, five, 10, we've heard over 10 times in terms of the amount of um, code that someone can write in a day, that's just gonna increase productivity. And as long as that's not inflationary because you know it's a digital service and actually um, you, know, you don't get paid anymore, but you get more work done, this could be very exciting. And, the, and sort of the, the right analogy, I think, is um, some of the desktop um, computer work, the internet work that happened in the mid 90s uh, as the internet really accelerated um, what it meant to be connected for companies. Uh, and those were you know, some very good years. So we don't know what, you know, when you say what inning, what year is it? It feels like it's 95, 96 in terms of this AI excitement. Now, every markets are always a little bit faster these days. We don't know. Yep. Um, but we're keeping an eye on it because um, there, there's something very special here that's happened in the first six months. And we think that actually could be very positive for economic expansion in years to come. And right. as long as we have inflation a little bit higher, which the Fed has said even before right. uh, this year, they said they were willing to have it run a little bit hotter. And then again, that yep. war was that black swan that took it. Yep, Unfortunately, exactly. it's beyond their scope. But all right. we you know we think it's all constructive. Adam, great, great hearing from you. Adam Gold, founder and CIO of Catam Hill uh, LLC. Right now, let's head down to Washington, D.C. We'll get World and National News with Nathan Hager. Paul, the Secret Service now confirms a powder found in the White House over the weekend was cocaine. A spokesman for the agency says it did its own test after an initial field test by the D.C. Fire Department. Now the Secret Service is looking into how it got there. Sources tell the Washington Post the drug was found near an area where West Wing tourists are told to leave cell phones. President Biden and his family were at Camp David at the time of that evacuation Sunday evening. Today, the president is back at the White House hosting the prime minister of Sweden in a show of support for that country's bid to join NATO. The president's likely to reiterate that support in Lithuania 
He's headed there for the NATO Leaders Summit next week. The White House also says it is hopeful UPS and the Teamsters come to an agreement after weeks of labor talks broke down overnight, bringing hundreds of thousands of UPS workers a step closer to a strike at the end of the month. Greg Valliere with AGF Investments says if a strike were to happen, it would be one of the biggest in decades. 340,000 workers could, could go out, and if they go out at the end of the summer as we're heading into the fall and the holiday season, that's the last thing you need for the U.S. supply chain. AGF's Greg Valliere was a guest on Bloomberg Daybreak. Yusuf Salam, one of the Central Park Five who spent years in prison for a rape they didn't commit, is now a step closer to winning a seat on the New York City Council. Yusuf Salam has won the Democratic primary for a seat representing Central Harlem. He talked about his run for public office on CBS News. This is for me. Mm -hmm. You know, this is developing me. This is this is altering me. Like right now, I get the opportunity to reflect light mm -hmm. in the most darkest places around the world. Yusuf Salam actually declared victory on primary night. The Associated Press, though, held off on calling the race until today. Additional votes released today showed he was the clear winner. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Nathan Hager. This is Bloomberg.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. It's 1240 on Wall Street. We do check markets all day long. At Bloomberg, we have got the Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ all slipping ahead of the FOMC minutes, 2 o'clock Wall Street time. Traders will be sifting through that uh, data to find out what the central bank may be taking action on later on this month. S&P right now down 10, dropped there of just about two-tenths of 1%. We've got the Dow down four-tenths of 1%, the Dow lower by 124 points. NASDAQ down 32, a decline there of two-tenths of 1%. NASDAQ 100 index down one-tenth of 1%. The Russell 2000 down now by 1%. Ten-year yield 1.91% with a two-year that's yielding 4.92%. Spot gold down 2 and a half dollars the ounce to 19.22 dropped there of two tenths of one percent and west texas intermediate crude up three percent now 71.84 barrel so a down day ahead of the fed minutes what is it though that is driving sentiment quincy crosby is chief global strategist at lpl financial and she was our guest right here on bloomberg markets overall it is more of the fed and it is how many more rate hikes do the, does the market expect? 80-something percent. Uh, I doubt that the Fed minutes is going to change that at all. If anything, it may push it up higher for the 26th of July. But the question is, do they get the one after that? And are they then finished? And we find out uh, when we get those Fed minutes, 2 o'clock Wall Street time, by the way. You can hear more of that conversation on the Bloomberg Tapes podcast. You can download it wherever you get your podcasts. American Equity Investment Life Holding has accepted that $4.3 billion cash and stock takeover bid from an arm of Canadian investment giant Brookfield. Shares of American Equity Investment Life Holding up now by just about 2%. Again, recapping stocks lower, S&P down 10, a decline of 2 tenths of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie Pellet, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, Molly Smith, Paul Sweeney here in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Boy, you walk through Midtown Manhattan and you see a lot of empty build office buildings, particularly on Mondays and Fridays, certainly in the summer. So the question is, you know, what's going on with this whole work from home, hybrid work thing? I don't know. I'm in every day, so it doesn't apply to me. Uh, but Rebecca, Rebecca Ray joins us. She's executive vice president of human capital at the conference board. Hey, Rebecca, we are well on the other side of this pandemic. Thank goodness. Um, a lot of parts of life are starting to normalize again. Um, but working in the office ain't one of them. Where are we in that whole, where are we working these days? How are we working these days? What's the latest thinking? Sure. Well, Paul, thank you for, for having me. Um, you know, it's still a mixed bag. I think that this uh, request to come to the office didn't quite uh, elicit the, the groundswell of employees rushing back to a physical workplace. And then as they began to strongly encourage it, or in some cases mandate it, that's not working out too well either. And I recognize fully that there are many situations where people don't have the option to work either a hybrid or a fully remote schedule. But for those who do, simply mandating it as though that was all that's necessary to sort of return to, to normalcy, if that's even possible, that's not been a winning strategy. You know, I wonder here, Rebecca, that um, you know, I hear a lot of people say, if my company's going to make me go in five days a week, I'm out. Quitting, <laughs> it's not for me. Um, but, you know, you look at where the quits rate has been, uh, this is like a measure of how many people quit their jobs in the economy, and it's dropped down a lot. You know, great resignation time, people were quitting left and right, but not so much anymore. So who really has the bargaining power right now in that employer-employee relationship? I think that continues to shift. I think that uh, you know our, our latest uh, research in this area said that 28% of those who said their organizations had mandated a return to uh, on-site work said that their level of intent to stay had decreased in the last six months. And that's pretty much parallel across the board. It's a, in terms of a drop in their level of engagement, their intent to stay, their mental health, and their um, sense of well-being. And so that should concern, I think, all of us who are looking to try to have workplaces that attract and retain top talent. Um, but, I, but I do think that um, where we might have seen during what was called the great 
resignation or realignment or reimagining or use the R word you like, mm -hmm. you know, that was, I think, a lot of pent up demand for people who would normally have changed. And most of those who changed jobs were those who are earlier in career. And that is what you would have expected. I think it's just sort of fact working, maybe even on scale. Yeah, I, I think there's several things days a week or three days a week or Fridays off and it. it, it it's all over the map and every culture is going to need to figure out what works for them and so that they can still deliver business results. But I, but I do think that the companies that are having some success here are the ones that are thinking about how do they meet people where they are. So for example, uh, women are uh, more concerned about working in a physical workplace than are men. And that could very well be the nature of the jobs that are necessarily fully remote may indeed be uh, an occupation that is uh, has more of a preponderance of men. It could also be in, a, in an industry where they already have um, a scarcity of workers. And certainly women are going to be more sensitive to the cost and the availability of childcare. So I think people, employers are looking at doing a couple of things, trying to make the workplace more uh, supportive. So some are looking at bringing on uh, on-site health care, excuse me, uh, child care. And also there are many organizations that are looking to make it a purposeful return to the workplace so that it isn't simply coming back for its own sake, because very few people are leaping at the chance to get at that color printer in the office. Um, many of them are looking at ways to say, here's why we need to be together for this particular um, event. Thinking of, of returning to the work, similar to the way we used to think about an offsite, you know, you knew what was going to be discussed, you knew who would be speaking, you knew what you hoped the outcomes would be, and you knew how it would either support a new product launch or celebrate success or celebrate a merger or help to build a culture. And, and I think there's a lot of good reasons why people would need to be back in the office or could benefit from being back in the office, particularly workers who are earlier in career for in terms of development and opportunities and just to really get to understand what it's like to have a job and some people who are, you know, right out of college. But I think employers have sometimes not articulated just why those are good reasons. And that's why you should consider coming back, not simply so that you can sit in a cube farm and the boss can watch the top of your head as you labor away. So as you just mentioned, um, you know, people just graduating from college, we've got Gen Z rising now into the workplace here. How, what, are you, what is your sense on what employers need to be doing to meeting uh, that generation where they're at? I think a lot of it is about the development. Now, you know, there are consultancies arising now of people who can help uh, employers help their people understand what it's like to hold a job or how to show up at work and that sort of thing, which, which you know, is, that, that's great. But I think that the opportunity to be developed, the opportunity to be part of exciting projects, the opportunity to uh, learn from others who understand the industry better, that those are great reasons uh, to, to articulate. And I think employers need to talk about that differently to different generations. Rebecca, what do you think of the argument that says, hey, watch, see what happens when we get unemployment back to five or five and a half percent, uh, yeah. see where the leverage is. Does that have any merit to you? I, I'm sure there's some of that. I, I also think there are people who feel so strongly about the collective experience that we have had, and granted, many people have experienced it to greater or deeper depths, but we've all been through a collective experience where we've learned that our lives might possibly look and, and be workable uh, in one way that yep. may not necessarily look like full-time employment and on-site uh, suggest uh, on-site uh, location. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And people are and the research that we've done, that of others, they're willing to take a pay cut to have more work-life balance. Their right. mental health is suffering, and so people are going to make those choices. All right, Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate getting your thoughts here on a very uh, dynamic and, and fluid uh, uh, situation, which is how to go back to work. Rebecca Ray, Executive Vice President of Human Capital of the Conference Board, uh, joining us there. Uh, looking at the markets here, we have the S&P off uh, about a quarter of 1%. We're going to have more coming up. This is Bloomberg. Let's get some company news right now. Steve Rappaport. Paul, a new platform is coming to the social media block. Meta is expected to roll out the Threads app tomorrow. Bloomberg intelligence analyst Mandeep Singh thinks it's the right time for Meta to make this move. I think it's coming at a good time in the sense that, uh, you know, Meta as a stock has done well this year, and they've proven that they could catch up from behind, as has been the case with Reels. So for the longest time, 
everyone didn't give them a chance, you know, with the videos and uh, Reels product. And, and they've proven that they can take it to $5 billion run rate. Singh also notes Meta has an opportunity to capitalize on recent turmoil and policy changes over at Twitter. Moderna stock is up after the drug maker signed a deal to make mRNA vaccines for China. Bloomberg's Gina Cervetti reports. Moderna signed a memorandum of understanding and land collaboration agreement on Wednesday to work toward researching, developing, and producing mRNA vaccines in China, according to a statement. The developer of a vaccine for COVID-19 may invest around a billion dollars, according to a local media report. The Cambridge, Massachusetts-based drug maker said any medicines produced under the deal will be only for the Chinese market and won't be exported. Moderna adding the agreement targets unmet needs for Chinese patients. Gina Cervetti, Bloomberg Radio. Thanks, Gina. One airline is telling passengers to leave their luggage at home thanks to a new program where they can rent their clothes. Japan Airlines and Sumitomo Corp say it's to promote sustainable tourism and convenience. Those are the company stories we're following this hour. I'm Steve Rappaport. This is Bloomberg. Stay tuned for more Bloomberg Markets coming up. You're listening to Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. All right, Molly Smith and Paul Sweeney here in the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers Studio in New York City. S&P 500 off a quarter of 1%. The NASDAQ off just about uh, the same here. Call out the VIX for Tom Keen. I know he's listening. He sits just above 
114. Only oh, spectacularly low. Uh, on the commodities front, circle back uh, to a discussion we had earlier. WTI crude oil up almost 3% today, $71.85. So uh, continued cuts in production coming out of OPEC Plus having a little bit of an impact on the market. Right now, let's sit down to Washington, D.C. We'll get world and national news with Nancy Lyons. Thanks, Paul. The suspect accused of opening fire in a Philadelphia neighborhood Monday night was in court this morning and was charged with more than 30 offenses, including murder and attempted murder. Five people died, four others were injured. Police say the 40-year-old was armed with an AR-15 style rifle and was wearing body armor during the entire shooting incident. A re record number of travelers showed up at the nation's airports over the holiday weekend and had to cope with thousands of flight cancellations and delays. The airlines will have to cope long-term with staffing issues, inability of airports to expand, even slow delivery of new planes. Helene Becker, airline analyst at the firm Cowan, said in a Bloomberg interview. It's going to be more seats per departure, so bigger aircraft, and it's going to be fewer departures per day. The air traffic control is understaffed. The entire system is just overtaxed. You add thunderstorms and nothing's taking off, the next thing you know, people are trapped. Becker said both pilots and air traffic controllers are retiring faster than they can be replaced, and air fares will continue to rise. In Washington, Irv Chapman, Bloomberg Radio. Meta, the parent company behind Facebook and Instagram, is launching a Twitter rival app called Threads tomorrow. The newly formed app will allow users to retain followers from photo sharing platform Instagram and then keep the same username. Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde says many are calling it a Twitter killer. The scale could be phenomenal because it's going to be intertwined with Instagram automatically. So you leverage the same profile, you're able to therefore follow the same accounts, and ultimately the couple of billion people who use it on a monthly basis automatically could start to get into threads. Again, Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde. More than 300,000 United Parcel Service workers are closer to striking after the, comp the company failed to reach an agreement with the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Negotiations fell apart in the wee hours of this morning. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. Now back to you, Paul and Molly. All right, Nancy, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Uh, Molly Smith, Paul Sweeney here in a Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. All right, the number one women's seat at Wimbledon is... Iga Sviatek. She's pretty good, right? Yeah, she's decent. She won a couple majors. <laughs> um, could win this one. Um, I wanted to ask you, Paul, have you heard about Iga's um, bakery title? I have not. So this is, a, you know, if any of you are familiar with tennis scoring, um, winning a set six love called a bagel. Okay. Or a six one, a breadstick. <laughs> and Iga has racked up a lot of these um, in th this spring season of hers, and she just uh, got another bagel this morning at Wimbledon. So good start for her um, out on center court. Now, is this it, are the, is a women's game where anyone can win? Because I feel like in a men's game, even though it is the, top, the big three of one for so much, they're so good. Anybody can come out of and, and kind of win it. Is that true in the women's game as well? So there has been some talk about a big three kind of emerging within women's tennis. Obviously okay. nothing compared to the caliber of Djokovic, Nadal, Federer that you just alluded to right. in the men's game. But Sviatek, part of this uh, on the women's side, as well as the second seed, Sabalenka, and the third seed, the returning champion, um, Elena Rabakina, they have really been very consistent at the highest level in these last few majors. And um, they're kind of, they've definitely separated themselves from the pack. Djokovic has won the most majors. Is he the best men's player of all time, do you think? I would say so. I think by pretty much every way you slice and dice the numbers, it's hard to contest anyone else. Yeah. Federer's, I'm a Federer guy. I mean, I love Raj too. Yeah. He, um, that dude is so stylish. I was going to say the class. Phenomenal class. Did you see class. him yesterday? Yes. Um, he was out in the Royal Box. Yep. Yeah. Gave a hat tip to Andy Murray. So, hey, if Roger <laughs> tells you you're doing a good job, I'll take that. Yeah, the, he's a stylish dude, and he speaks like 27 different languages. Uh, just you know, what a what a great time for the for the sport. We had the big three were just uh, kind of. We should have him on the show. We should get him on there. Mm -hmm. All right, sound on with Joe Matthew. That starts right now. Bitcoin ETF is on. Firms refile their applications with the SEC after it indicated that the initial filings were insufficient. And that would ESG by any other name sound as sweet. We're going to discuss why many managers are trying to dodge the label that was once the big trend. 
And as we celebrate America's independence from Great Britain this week, let's take a look at one patriotic ETF that honors the USA. And Matt, before we get there, as always, Eric Balchunas from Bloomberg Intelligence, he's here with us now taking a look at the flows. Eric, what do you got? Katie, Matt, fireworks weren't just going off last night. They're going off in the flows. This is unbelievable. $31 billion into ETFs over the past five days. $27 billion of that is in equity ETFs. Again, we've been talking all year about the FOMO drought. That is over by a long shot. And look who's at the top, the three amigos, VU, IVV, and SPY. That means all kinds of investors are there, institutions, traders, retail. And then for extra credit, you got the Qs in there. You couldn't ask for a more bullish leaderboard over the past week. So everyone looking for good sentiment, this is it. Let's look at the outflows, and it gets even better. Look at what's at the top, BIL. Unless you're a short-term debt manager, you're probably thrilled to see money coming out of short-term debt and going into the equity market. So back to Bitcoin ETFs, which is also interesting in the flows. Speaking of a FOMO drought, there's really been no money into Bitcoin ETFs or sort of blockchain thematic ETFs over the past year until about two, three weeks ago when BlackRock announced it's filing for a Bitcoin ETF. Here's all the Bitcoin ETFs in the, in the world, actually. So we have Canada, Europe, a little bit of US. Look at the one month flow, $432 million. Well, look at the year to date, it's only 400. In other words, it was negative until the past month. That's how big that BlackRock filing was in terms of sparking some inflows. So we've got FOMO going on both in equities, finally, and in crypto. And we have the best guest to talk about this. I mean, we, we couldn't be more on the news than we are, Eric. Ophelia Snyder joins us right now, co-founder and president of 21 Shares. And you are, first of all, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. You have applied for a U.S. ETF together with ARC, right? Um, yes. How is the process? I mean, is it daunting to deal with this SEC, or is it uh, kind of run in the mill, run of the mill, how it always is? So, from our perspective, we've done this in many different countries in terms of engaging with regulators and in getting them comfortable with these kinds of structures. Uh, we're celebrating our five-year anniversary as in terms of offering products in the sector in November, um, and we've. We engage with basically everyone. The, the and SEC, you've got 37 yes. ETFs so, that deal with crypto specifically. Yes, all in the spot market. So this is something we've done a lot of. Working with regulators around this stuff is something we've also done a lot of. Um, we like it. It's usually a very productive process in terms of both building good product and also in terms of, quite frankly, helping move the holistic crypto market forward. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about this latest wave of filings that we're seeing for a U.S. spot product, which, as you know very well, doesn't exist yet. If we think about what's different, it seems like a lot of people in the industry, in both the ETF and the crypto industry, have really seized on surveillance sharing agreements. And some people have called it a silver bullet. I think that person's sitting right here, actually. <laughs> is it fair to say that? What exactly is this surveillance sharing agreement? And do you think this is finally going to push it over the line? So surveillance sharing agreements are usually a extremely not interesting piece of back-end infrastructure between securities exchanges that no one ever really talks about. But it's actually quite standard market practice. It basically just means if you think there is a trade that is designed to manipulate a market in some way, you have the ability to go and request data around that as part of an investigation essentially. Mm -hmm. It's quite a light touch thing. It's, it's not a recurring data feed. It's not a massive volume of information that's moving back and forth. It, it's quite simple. But in this case, it's actually which exchange it is that changes the conversation. Interesting. There have been surveillance sharing agreements in crypto before. The Winklevoss actually put that forward as part of their original filing 10 years ago around doing things like closing auctions and having those types of um, that type of information come out of the spot market. The difference here is that Coinbase represents such a large proportion of the US market for these products and is so well established in this market that that's actually the major difference. It's what proportion of flows does this really represent? And quite frankly, that's why this is so exciting. It's about how much of the market are you really able to cover here and how significant is Coinbase's role in the crypto spot markets. Well, let's talk about that because if you look globally, I think they're like 6 7% of global volume. But you go to U.S., they're the majority, right? So yes. is the SEC maybe just going to look at the U.S.? If so, that would make sense. Then there's this other theory that the SEC really just wants to uh, make Coinbase 
the one that's the most um, easy to eat, the one to work with with traditional finance because they don't really like Binance. And so they're just going to make Coinbase the bridge between DeFi and TradFi. And it's all part of a bigger plan. So the SEC, I mean, it's a complicated question, but ultimately it, it's unclear because commodities markets don't always have these kinds of agreements. So for example, gold, what percentage of gold is traded onshore versus offshore? How do you think about surveillance in that market is actually quite different, right? And you think about gold, it also has like a significant peer-to-peer -peer component and a significant outside of exchanges component. You go to a jeweler, you buy gold, theoretically that price is actually factored into the commodities market. Um, so I think it's actually quite unclear how they're going to interpret that. From our perspective, if the idea here is to focus on the US consumer, which is really how they've posited a lot of their rejections in the past, it is material that Coinbase is so large in this market. And I think there is some precedent for saying, OK, we can sort of centralize some of these flows through specific regulated on and off ramps or through specific surveilled on and off ramps. And that may be something that actually not only brings the US crypto market forward and sort of closer to parity with other markets around the world, but actually is likely a net benefit both for crypto as well as for this application process. We've, uh, we've had former SEC employees, lawyers, regulators on here in the past, and they've pointed out various issues that the the SEC may have with a Bitcoin spot ETF. One of them is um, settlement because of the volatility. Have you ever had any issues with that on the spot uh, Bitcoin or crypto ETFs you work Zero. on on the other side? Are there any issues that you could understand? Well, I get why the SEC is worried about Bitcoin um, because it's different than the other commodity ETFs in X, Y, or Z way. So it is different, but it's different largely in ways that actually make it a easier product in some respects. So for example, settlement is a lot faster. So that settlement lag that you're talking about can be essentially instantaneous. You're accepting physical delivery. It's a very different structure from that perspective. It's closer to like a physical gold product where you're delivering gold bars. Not In our products, for example, you're not exposed to any slippage on that um, from an execution perspective or from a, a settlements perspective. One of the, and you, you can actually do things like T0 or T1, which is obviously not really possible in traditional ETF markets. There are some peculiarities to do with crypto ETFs, and it's things like forks and airdrops and specific security issues and specific custody issues. But for example, I mean, we have a five-year track record of dealing with these. We've mm -hmm. dealt with pretty much every on-chain issue you can think of from forks, airdrops, hash wars, I mean, you name it, we've seen it. Um, and one of the interesting things is if you actually look at the performance of these products, they track consistently through those events. And it really highlights the need for people to actually know what they're doing in this space. This is not a copy paste from hey, I've run a, a legacy commodity product. There's nothing new here. There are specific things that are new here, but they're mm -hmm. now well understood and, and well documented, and there's a way to handle them that's actually very positive for investors. And I want to talk a little bit more about what engagement with the SEC has been like. One of the things making the rounds on crypto Twitter today, I'm not sure how much time you spend there, <laughs> is that there's speculation that spot Bitcoin ETF filers and the SEC will be meeting next week. Is that a scheduled meeting? And just more broadly, what has engaging with the SEC been like on these filings? It's hard for me to comment on any like active ongoing regulatory process for uh, obvious reasons, but more broadly, I have always found the process of engaging with regulators to be a positive one. And ultimately, what everyone should be working towards is the same goal. I think people sometimes forget what the SEC's job actually is, mm. which is to ensure the operations of like of efficient markets and of fair markets in this country, which is incredibly important. You don't want people you know, doing things that are unethical. You don't want people committing fraud in financial markets. It's their job to protect consumers from that, and that's actually really important. It's not their job to decide whether or not a product should exist based on a business rationale. Mm -hmm. And so typically these conversations with regulators have a tendency to focus very much on that, on, on protecting investors, on how do you think about pricing and market structure and how these products actually operate. And we've typically both really enjoyed them, and they've been very productive. Um, just everybody asked me, who's going to be out first? And you guys are in pole position because you filed in, in April. BlackRock filed uh, a couple months later, but they're BlackRock. So people are like, well, maybe they'll get out first. Or maybe the SEC will just approve a bunch at once. What's your take on that? I think um, there's a pretty 
well-established practice around these things from the SEC, which is to be, you process applications in the order in which they're received. Changes to that have much wider implications for the ETF markets in general, securities markets in general. Um, that is, our view is that it's un unlikely that that's a precedent that people are interested in changing because it has much wider impacts than anything to do with a crypto ETF. Ophelia, great having you on the show today. Thanks so much for joining us. Ophelia Snyder there, co-founder and president of 21 Shares. This is Bloomberg. Sports and money. They've always gone together. But never before have sports been so massively influential and as lucrative as they are today. NFL, NBA, none of them were what they are today when they were born. There's leagues that are being thought of and built every day. New teams, new leagues, new business models, even entirely new sports. I never in a million years would have thought this is what my life would be like. We set out to find what's happening and what's about to happen at the nexus of business, sports, and culture. Getting involved from a business perspective was something that was very natural and easy transition for me. From the pickleball courts of Arizona. To the Kabaddi tournaments in India. To the cornhole boards at your local tailgate. No! This is what's next in sports. and Tim Stanovac bring you the latest news from the worlds of business, technology, politics, and more. How does the Fed play into this and what the Fed does, yeah. potentially? This is so exhausting and this is so all-encompassing. Listen on Bloomberg Radio and streaming on YouTube and Bloomberg Originals. BSO Now is your online home for weekly Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. See new concerts that go behind the scenes, plus acclaimed archival concerts. Visit bso.org slash now, where the music plays on. BSO season sponsor, Bank of America. Welcome back to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifeld. Time now for the ETF brief where I walk you through the trends and the stories that caught my eye in the ETF industry. And we start with the take a look at the flows so far this year. So you have BlackRock in white, you have Vanguard in blue. You can see that Vanguard still crushing it, but this is interesting. And I stole this chart from Eric Valchunas. You can see that JP Morgan is in green there, actually neck and neck with BlackRock. If you look over the past five years, usually it's not even a competition. So something to keep an eye on as we enter the second half of the year. Something else we talk about a lot is the total lack of volatility. Of course, the VIX has just been grinding lower and lower. So I thought we should take a look at the ProShares Short VIX Short Term Futures ETF, which of course bets against volatility. As you can see, that's been paying off because right now this ETF is at the highest in at least five years, of course, as the VIX continues to grind towards the single digits. Let's also talk about ESG. We talk about it all the time. It seems like money managers want to stop talking about it because if you take a look at sustainable fund debuts so far this year, 56% of them are saying we're thematic, okay? We're not ESG. So it's become a little bit of a dirty word. In fact, ESG has become such a negative term to some that even BlackRock's Larry Fink says he's retiring it. Last week, V told Hennish of UPenn's Wharton School pushed back against Fink. I find that really disappointing because I think if we rebrand it, first of all, it's going to take a while, right? We it took us a while to get to the term ESG. It might take us six months, 18 months to come up with a new brand. And guess what? The same people who funded climate denial and are now attacking ESG are going to attack that new brand. So let's fight the fight. Let's say this is just good investment. This is good strategy. This is what we should be expecting of our firms. All right, Katie, let's talk more about this issue with Bloomberg Cross Asset reporter Peyton Forte. Peyton, thanks so much for joining us. Um, can we see in terms of the flows, for example, the lack of uh, 
commitment to ESG by investors? Do they still want to buy the products? Um, do they still believe in the mission and they don't want to buy the products? How do you see it? Yeah, so um, I'm seeing that investors and also the uh, fund managers that market these products, uh, they still want to offer ESG, even if it's not under the acronym ESG. Um, and so uh, RBC Capital Markets found that 56% of new fund launches this year, uh, sustainable new fund launches this year, uh, have been thematic rather than ESG, and a third of fund assets uh, lie in um, uh, thematics rather than ESG. Uh, but there's certainly still uh, a, a willingness and a desire to uh, give that exposure to investors, just not um, with the acronym that is attached to it. So um, you can kind of see that in the flows, that particularly in the U.S., um, they have uh, plateaued a little bit. Um, but uh, it has been, it, it, it's not as bad as it has been uh, last year. Uh, they're coming back. Uh, you can really see that in a lot of these climate the trick funds, um, but you know, as far as like social and maybe on you know, the government side of things, uh, maybe not catching it quite a bit as love. Yeah. And tell us a little bit more about that distinction, thematic versus ESG. Why are issuers gravitating specifically towards that thematic umbrella? So with a thematic fund, it can literally be anything. So uh, a thematic ETF, uh, it's just uh, like any other traditional ETF, a basket of securities, uh, but these are just more targeted. They offer more uh, narrow strategies. So um, you can have something like artificial intelligence, you can have uh, a robotic fund, you can have a clean energy fund uh, with a very targeted uh, focus uh, in a very narrow category uh, without having to label it ESD. So for those who want a, a women's opportunity mm -hmm. uh, sort of fund, they don't have to necessarily have ESD as a label um, in order to get that sort of exposure. Peyton, it's great reporting. Really appreciate your time. And I like the bills cap behind you. Bloomberg's Peyton Forte, thank you so much. Still ahead, we're going to drill down into private real estate with David Auerbach of Armada ETF Advisors next. This is ETF IQ on Bloomberg. The top names in climate change are on Bloomberg. I want everybody committed to the kind of action that we need. We have a global emergency now. You know, we're still putting 162 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into the sky every day, using the sky as an open sewer. That's trapping as much extra heat as would be released by 600,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every day. That's what the scientists tell us, and the data shows it. That's crazy. That's why we have a third of Pakistan underwater. That's why we have the historic heat wave in China. Nothing comparable to that ever. That's why the heat records are broken every year. And we're seeing in an increase in the flows of climate refugees crossing international borders that, that are due to vastly expand unless we take action to solve the climate crisis. Nobody covers climate change like Bloomberg, your global business authority. Bloomberg UK, your source for news and analysis covering the biggest challenges facing the UK government, economy, financial services, and markets. Tax cuts should not be the priority. It's about a credible plan for growth over the next two, three years. In this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients? It was disruptive, and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works. Now we're having the perfect storm in the UK. Watch Francine Lacqua, Thursdays at 9.30 a.m., only on Bloomberg, your global business authority.
This is Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Matt Miller alongside Katie Greifeld. Eric Valchunas from Bloomberg Intelligence is back with us now for today's drill down where we focus on one ETF. Eric, what do you got? Katie, today we have PRVT, which is the private real estate strategy via liquid REITs ETF. A little mouthful there. But that sort of is exactly what it is. It's trying to em emulate private REITs, right, which is a whole thing like Blackstone, right, a lot of in institutions like that market, but to do it via liquid REITs. Why? Well, you get daily liquidity with liquid REITs. You don't get your money stuck in there, which has, has happened to some of those other funds. Uh, it's actively managed, so you can see a yes there. The expense ratio is 59 basis points. It just launched. It's a baby, a couple days old only. Uh, let's look at the holdings, and uh, the number of holdings is also important. So you can see here, these are actually publicly traded REITs. Okay, Again, it's not private, trying to emulate private REITs. And then look over here at the number of holdings. It's 52. So again, this is going to jump around a lot. That's a pretty concentrated holding. Probably goes uh, to complement your sort of core holdings. Let's look at the returns versus, versus VRB. Now, I get it. VRB may not even be the benchmark, but it's the biggest REIT ETF out there. Underperforming a little, but again, it's been a couple days. I think if this thing can beat VRB or make the case that this gives you REIT exposure without the annoyance of gating, uh, this thing could get some looks. Eric, thank you. And joining us to talk about this ETF now is David Auerbach, Managing Director of Armada ETFs, of course, behind this ETF. And like Eric said, this fund is a baby. It just launched, and it's a tricky time for anything real estate, anything that touches REITs. Why now? Well, first of all, REIT is not a REIT is not a REIT. There's so many different sectors that are out there. There's so many different stories that we feel now is the perfect time for investors to pivot to those liquid REITs. As Eric mentioned, the private REITs are seeing a couple of different things. Things, liquidity issues, the cost, as well as the uh, valuation gap between public to private. And we can cover all those, but let's start on the liquidity angle. As you mentioned, private REITs and private real estate funds have gated uh, investor redemption requests. Uh, the largest vehicle just announced they only fulfilled 17% of the investor redemption requests in June. And from the period that that started in November of last year till this point, investors will only be able to get about 90% of their money out of those funds. From a cost perspective, many of these private real estate funds have layered investment fees, including selling and service fees, management fees, and a performance hurdle once they get over a certain rate. Well, that could be add up to about 3.5% a year. And then from a valuation gap perspective, right now, it's the widest divergence between listed REITs and private real estate funds. And according to a recent study by NAREIT, the National Association of Real Estate Investment Trusts, in a nutshell, as that divergence reconverges, the performance of the listed REITs compared compared to the private guys has been significant. So from a very basic perspective, the wider the divergence, the greater the outperformance. Why has private, by the way, great ticker. I'm glad you got PRVT. Why has private performed so well? Is it just the hot sort of shiny new object right now? Well, these private real estate sponsors have assembled great portfolios and great markets comprised of residential, apartments, single family rentals, industrial REITs, data centers. These are the sectors that have done really well in the publicly perspective. So for us to basically mirror these private real estate funds down to the percentage as far as the asset class and the geographic location, we can learn a lot from these smart management teams, but bring a more affordable product for all investors to participate in. So is the audience for this advisors who can't get into those private REITs, or are you going to try to peel away some of the institutions? Because one of the things with, with ETFs is, I agree, they do a lot of the things that you can get for cheaper and they're liquid, but the institutions like that, like, um, um, specialty. They like the exclusiveness. So, oh, I'm in the Blackstone REIT. You can't really get that with an ETF. How do you ba uh, battle that? So that's actually the perfect reason why we brought this product to market because it gives investors the chance to both participate in the world of private as a complement using our publicly traded REIT ETF wrapper. And so, yes, it is geared towards advisors. It is geared towards high net worth investors, but also those institutional folks that potentially want to play in private REITs. But, you know, th here's a good portfolio that replicates in publicly traded REITs that, again, is market to market on a daily basis. It pays a quarterly dividend that, again, we control. And so we feel this is a good story that benefits all investors. And liquidity, obviously. And liquidity. Being a gigantic, a major key, as someone once said. David, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure having you here in studio. David Auerbach there of Armada ETFs. And before we go, yesterday was the 4th of July, so here's a special look at an ETF that celebrates the U.S.
The U.S. is celebrating its independence this week, and we're honoring the land of the free and the home of the brave with the River North Patriot ETF, known by the ticker FLDZ. It invests in mid to large cap companies that generate at least 90% of their revenue in the U.S. But what sets it apart is the fund's mission to give back. The majority of advisory fees and all managing profits are donated directly to the charity Folds of Honor, which provides educational scholarships to the families of fallen and disabled service members as well as first responders. The fund has about 270 holdings, including CarMax, Tenant Healthcare, Pulte Group, Chipotle, and CSX. Since it launched last year, it's been outperforming the S&P 500, but in the past two months has started losing momentum. The fund has only about $3 million in assets and a high expense ratio of 70 basis points. It gets a green light in the Bloomberg Intelligence traffic light system with one warning for the fund being actively managed. By the way, a quick programming note. Next week, we're going to be back on our normally scheduled hour, 1 p.m. on Monday. On back Monday. on Monday. And it's yeah. a big one. We're going to be talking to Salim Ramji of iShares, which is great. We just had 21 shares. Yeah, he's the global head. He runs the whole business. And, you know, now we're, we'd have the two firms that are in the pole position, I think, or the favorites to yeah. win the spot Bitcoin ETF race back to back. So pretty good programming. Couldn't so, be more on the news. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for joining us. Us, both of you and all of you and if you can't get enough of the ETFs just a reminder that you can listen to Eric and Joel Weber on Trillions it's their bi-weekly podcast that covers the industry that does it for us at Bloomberg ETF IQ I'm Matt Miller with Katie Greifeld and Eric Balchunas this is Bloomberg this is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. It was unimaginable that we would see rates move this fast. That was not in the realm of thinking. Just the timeline of what they knew and when they knew it. Why didn't they do anything about it? When do we have to see the kill? <laughs> it's always for the Fed to respond to it. And this is really the tension. Be informed. You cannot be overly data dependent. You've got to have a view of where you're going. Be prepared. I think the earnings season might actually be the positive surprise that people are not expecting. Be ahead of the game. It's certainly the beginning of something, something we need to keep an eye on. And that, I think, is really going to be an interesting takeaway from this moment. Well, you go all birds on us, and you say, turn, turn, turn. Is that what we're doing right now? Yeah, big question coming into the show for us was, when is that turn going to be? What a fantastic conversation. The news you need. The president's calling on manufacturers to make more in America. It is working, and it's reflected in these jobs numbers. The American analysis you trust. How do you take this anecdotal data and say, really, just focus on the now because that is going to tell you where we're going? What is the measurement of uncertainty that we have in studying the American economy? Milton well, Friedman had said there are long and variable lags and the impact of monetary policy, but man, it's a long slog. The best way to start your day. People are tuning into this program on a daily basis. Oh, come on, it makes for good TV. Let's move on. Bloomberg Surveillance, weekdays from 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. I've always been a person who's just been attracted to hair. I like to sit and think and theorize how I can manifest these uh, visions that I have for braiding and how I can take something that may seem like it's a line drawing in my mind and apply that to someone's scalp. We are the only culture that has hair that grows out of our head the way that it does. Anyone from the African diaspora is born with this amazingly curly hair that can be shaped into a variety of different ways of expression. I want black people to love themselves for how they naturally appear and also to appreciate the cultural practices such as braiding that our ancestors have practiced for centuries. the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on-demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars.
Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. I'm John Oldman. And I'm Matt Miller. Let's get a quick check on the markets today after the incredible rally that we saw last week pushed us up to S&P 4450. We're off a little bit today, but not by much. Looking at 4447 on the benchmark index. You do see that uh, yields are coming up about seven basis points. So 392.76 is the debate rages between, you know, Bill Dudley and Morgan Stanley. Do we go to four and a half? Do we go to two uh, or three? Bloomberg dollar index gaining at 1234. So uh, this is one of the calls at the beginning of the year. Everyone thought the dollar was going to decline against all of its major trading partners. That has not uh, panned out. NYMEX crude coming up almost two bucks a barrel to 71.73. Remember that uh, we were closed for trading yesterday. So you'll see NYMEX up um, from Monday's close. I think Brent, the global benchmark, is down um, from the close on Tuesday. John, what are you looking at? Lots of different stock movers today, Matt. Meta in focus. Uh, we are obviously awaiting the launch of this Twitter clone this week, and we'll see how that plays out. Analysts trying to crunch the numbers on how successful they can be. I should note that here in Canada, you've got continued tensions between the government and Meta. Now the government says it's not going to advertise on Meta platforms, and already today, two key telco players have said the same thing after the passing of a recent law. Moderna shares are up almost 2% today. The company pushing into the Chinese market with mRNA vaccines. And UBS, we're going to talk a little bit more about the strike worries. Right now, that stock is off about 2%. And, of course, Matt, we've been watching Rivian shares today as the company uh, making those uh, electric vans for Amazon and for the first time getting them into the European market, plus some encouraging analyst commentary helping the stock on an intraday basis right now up about 2%. Yeah, Rivian firing on all cylinders, or I'm not sure what the equivalent phrase would be in EV terms. Ed Ludlow might know he joins us right now from Irvine, California, where he will be interviewing the CEO of Rivian in just a few hours. Ed, it does look like the stars are aligning uh, finally, maybe again, yeah. um, for this company. They're finally delivering these vans. They're delivering our products outside of the U.S. for the first time. How's it look from your vantage point? I think the analogy you're looking for, Matt, is running on dual motors or running yes. on full charge or something like that. I mean, as DA Davidson notes in its in its upgrade on the stock, all of the headlines recently have been positive. And I guess the question for RJ Scarring, who we speak later today, is was there a turning point for production? They did really ramp up production and deliveries beat expectations in the quarter gone. It's actually a really technology-focused story. What they did was shifting the shelf to an in-house motor, the Enduro. That required fewer power semiconductors, or at least give them the flexibility to adjust supply chain based on the semiconductor side, allowing them to ramp. And then, as John noted, they've, they've gone outside of the U.S., just 300 units to cities in Germany and the Amazon ban. But Amazon is the biggest shareholder, right? And I think any news that's positive on that relationship, the market generally regards as positive. And I guess just to, to put some more numbers behind this story, Ed, for Amazon, their goal is to see what? Upwards of 100,000 of these vehicles available by, yes. call it 2030? Yeah, 100,000 by the end of the decade. I would caution that the original goal was 10,000 units by the end of 2022. And so far, Amazon is running about 3,000 nationwide here in the U.S. They're way behind their original schedules. But that was the story with Rivian. You know, the 2020 at one IPO is listing in 2022 was a horrible year. You know, they had to reset expectations. They just missed their full year guidance of 25,000 units in a single EV factory in normal Illinois that on paper is capable of building so much more. So again, another question for RJ's garage. Is that 50,000? All right, it looks like we're having technology problems. Uh, um, but it's telecommunications and not in EVs. So hopefully we can get that fixed and we will uh, get back to Ed Ludlow later on in today. You don't want to miss his one-on-one -on -one interview with RJ Scaringer, the CEO of Rivian. That's at 4.30 p.m. New York time, and we will be broadcasting that on Bloomberg Television. Now let's stick with the car news here. A growing pile of delinquent car loans are threatening to deliver losses in a corner of Wall Street that until now has been a sea of calm. The asset backed securities market. Bloomberg Scott Carpenter covers auto loans and joins us now. And Scott, this is fascinating um, because 
I didn't even realize that we haven't seen a default on these kind of securities since the 90s. We even made it through the great financial crisis without defaults on, I guess, car loan subprime ABS. That's right. These bonds have a reputation for being rock solid, essentially, which is funny because they're actually built on something that is, you know, by definition, less than a perfectly good loan, a subprime, it's a loan, a car loan from somebody whose credit score is not great. But yeah, it's been since the since the, nine, the 1990s that one of these has essentially taken a, a loss on their principal and delivered losses for investors. And I guess the, the one, two concern, Scott, as, as the reporting uh, you've outlined indicates, is that uh, on the one hand, there, there's a worry about uh, people being able to, you know, pay uh, on their loans, but also the fact that we've just seen an explosion of issuance over the last decade. That's right, yeah. I, th I think they, they came through the financial crisis. They did well. And everybody thought, well, that was great. You know, let's, let's do more of these. These are safe. These are not subprime mortgage bonds. And they became really popular. They yield uh, well, so they're a good thing. Investors like them because they deliver, you know, good returns. And they've been very safe. A combination of those two things is a recipe for more issuance. More companies came along in the last 10 years, got more comfortable with them. And then now this happens. Some companies got a little bit uh, carried away. The pandemic threw off their models a little bit. They started making loans that people couldn't repay. And uh, prices were skyrocketing, so that makes it more difficult as well. A couple of these lenders shut down. So yeah. it's not like consumers aren't. I mean, a lot of them are not paying, but some of them can't pay, right? Because it takes months to move um, that kind of uh, uh, network around a little bit. Um, and the yeah. other interesting thing I found, Scott, is that these loans are often incredibly over collateralized, right? I mean, the ABS, because That's I right. read that maybe 30 or 35 percent over collateralized is not unusual, except now. That's right. These, the, the bond investors know that a lot of people are going to default. So they build in what's called over, over collateralization. There's more loans in the bond than you need in order to repay investors. What's extraordinary about this, and by the way, this reporting is by my colleague, uh, Carmen Arroyo. I'm kind of, I'm just standing in for her, her voice is uh, a little bit hoarse today. Uh, what's extraordinary about these is that they've burned through all of that over collateralization. So it's so many people have defaulted that it's now getting to the point where there's no longer enough principal left. There's, there, it's on track right. to not be able to repay the investors. And that's 